Done. Thank you. Um, our next item is an update to an item that we discussed last October, the PM 2.5 state implementation plan for the San Joaquin Valley. As I think everybody knows by now, the San Joaquin Valley faces one of the greatest uh, challenges in dealing with fine particles of any area in the United States. Concerted efforts by both the district and ARB are therefore critical to protect public health of the residents of the valley. I'm especially pleased that we have a contingent of residents from the area uh, who are here this morning, and I look forward to their input and to the board's discussion. Mr. Corey, will you please introduce this item? Yes, thanks, Chair. And as you mentioned, last October, staff presented an initial plan for the 12 microgram per cubic meter annual PM 2.5 standard. Air quality modeling conducted for the plan demonstrated that although significant mobile source reductions will continue to occur, given the magnitude of the PM 2.5 challenge in the valley, these reductions would not be sufficient to meet the standard by the moderate deadline of 2021. And as allowed by the Clean Air Act, the plan included a request for a serious area classification with an attainment date of 2025. In October, the board directed staff to explore opportunities for achieving further near-term reductions from both stationary and mobile sources before it acted on the plan. Since then, staff has held two workshops in the Valley to present the foundation, the scientific foundation, and key strategies for attainment to solicit community input. Staff have also been participating in the Air District's public advisory work groups for a comprehensive 2.5, or rather PM 2.5 plan that will be heard by the board later this year. Staff's technical evaluation indicates that a balanced approach of both directly emitted PM 2.5 along with NOx reductions would provide the most effective path to attainment. In today's presentation, staff will describe near-term actions it is identified to achieve emission reductions and will also describe an overall attainment strategy for meeting both the annual and 24-hour PM 2.5 standards. Following today's presentation, staff will continue to work with the district and stakeholders to finalize an attainment strategy that incorporates early emission reduction opportunities that were returned to the board later this year. I'll now ask Wes Webster to sought to give the staff presentation. Webster. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Good morning, Chair Nichols and members of the board. Meeting PM 2.5 standards is the Valley's most critical air quality challenge. In today's update, I will summarize the board's direction from last October and report back on the work that has occurred over the last six months. Through this process, ARB and district staff have, have identified additional opportunities for near-term reductions that provide the foundation for a, com a comprehensive plan for meeting all of the health-based PM 2.5 standards. The board will not be taking action today, but I will be discussing the work that still needs to be completed and the schedule for bringing the comprehensive attainment plan to the board later this year. Last October, the board tabled consideration of the Valley's plan addressing the first step in efforts to meet the 12 microgram annual standard. Instead, the board directed staff to carry out the following actions. First, Conduct additional public outreach to provide stakeholders with an opportunity for meaningful dialogue on development of the plan. Second, identify additional near-term reduction opportunities from both stationary and mobile sources as part of a comprehensive attainment strategy for multiple PM 2.5 standards. Finally, the board requested that staff return and provide an update on staff's actions to implement the board's direction. Before I report on the status of efforts conducted to date, I'll provide a brief summary of PM 2.5 standards the Valley must address, as well as current control efforts, which are providing the foundation for the overall attainment strategy. The Federal Clean Air Act sets out re requirements for establishing air quality standards, as well as plans for meeting them. EPA is also required to periodically review standards to ensure that they remain protective of public health. Based on this review, EPA has established increasingly health protective PM 2.5 standards. This includes both a daily standard to protect against short-term exposure and an annual particle standard to address chronic health effects. EPA first established PM 2.5 standards in 1997. This included a daily standard of 65 micrograms, which the Valley now meets. 
At the same time, EPA also established an annual standard of, of 15 micrograms. The Valley missed its 2015 attainment deadline for this standard due to the severe weather conditions associated with the drought, which interrupted ongoing progress. As a result, the region must now develop a new plan. Under the Clean Air Act, attainment must be achieved as expeditiously as possible, along with controls reducing emissions by 5% per year. The target date for meeting this standard is 2020. As new health science became available showing health impacts at lower levels, the daily standard was strengthened in 2006 to 35 micrograms. The Clean Air Act specifies attainment deadlines for each new standard, and areas with more severe air quality are provided more time to attain, along with more stringent control requirements. For the 35 microgram daily standard, these deadlines range from 2019 to 2024. Finally, in 2012, the annual standard was further strengthened to 12 micrograms, with attainment required between 2021 and 2030. Addressing these multiple standards is not as complicated as is sometimes described. The key is developing a comprehensive strategy rather than individual strategies for each standard, and we are working with the district on this comprehensive planning approach. Current ARB and district control programs are providing the foundation for the overall attainment strategy. The chart on this slide illustrates progress in reducing mobile source NOx emissions, which are a key contributor to the formation of particles that make up about half of measured PM2.5 levels in the valley. The chart has three major colored sections, highlighting programmatic areas that have been fundamental to our success. Stringent engine standards for cars and trucks, cleaner fuels, and programs to accelerate the replacement of vehicles and engines. The diamonds indicate the start dates for key programs. Since 1990, these programs have reduced NOx emissions in the valley by about 60%. Looking forward, emissions are projected to continue to decline an additional 50% through 2025 as cleaner vehicles and equipment continue to enter the fleet. The chart on this slide provides a similar overview but now illustrating reductions in directly emitted PM2.5 emissions from stationary and area sources. The three major colored sections reflect district programs targeting sources of smoke, fugitive dust, and incentive programs. For smoke, the district has adopted a number of rules that have been progressively strengthened over time. These rules include controls on commercial cooking operations, limits on residential wood burning, and programs to manage agricultural and prescribed burning. Similarly, other regulations have reduced fugitive dust from agricultural operations, construction sites, and paved and unpaved roads. The district also operates a robust incentive program. Taken together, these district programs have reduced PM2.5 emissions in the valley by nearly 40%. Unfortunately, going forward, as these programs have now been fully implemented, emissions are projected to increase slightly as the valley's population continues to grow. Meeting 2.5 standards will therefore require further enhancements to build on the success of current district programs. Returning now to the board's direction from last October, both ARB and, dis and the district have conducted considerable public outreach through workshops and workgroup meetings. ARB began this process with a workshop in Fresno last December where staff presented the current science of PM2.5 in the Valley and the scope of potential approaches needed to meet the standards. And last week, ARB staff held an evening community meeting in Fresno to report on progress to date in developing a specific attainment strategy and to solicit feedback from Valley residents and stakeholders. Approximately 40 members of the public attended the community meeting. Along with ARB's outreach efforts, the district has conducted a complimentary series of workshops and workgroup meetings. The district held four workshops that focused on specific elements of overall PM 2.5 plan development along with a public advisory work group consisting of various Valley stakeholders. These meetings were also open to the public. The four work group meetings focused on air quality modeling and proposed control measures. These meetings have been instrumental in identifying the near-term reductions I'll be discussing next, along with development of the comprehensive attainment strategy. <clears throat> a diversity of sources contribute to PM 2.5 in the Valley representing a shared responsibility between ARB and the district. The new near-term actions identified since October on this slide therefore target a variety of sources which are key to effectively reducing PM2.5 levels. 
These near-term actions represent a collective effort by ARB and the district to achieve additional reductions that will help advance progress towards attainment. The new actions include district efforts to strengthen requirements limiting residential wood burning, enhanced control requirements for commercial char broiling, and measures to further reduce dust emissions from agricultural operations. In addition, incentive programs will further advance the deployment of cleaner technologies for trucks, tractors, and other off-road equipment. ARB has also identified a new measure for a heavy-duty truck smog check program to ensure trucks remain clean throughout their lifetime. Finally, the district has proposed more stringent control limits for boilers, IC engines, and glass plants. In the next section of the presentation, I will provide additional details on these actions as well as the benefits they provide as part of the comprehensive control strategy for all the PM 2.5 standards. Defining an effective strategy begins with understanding the sources contributing to PM 2.5 throughout the year. Ambient PM 2.5 levels are made up of many constituents that can, e that can either be directly emitted, such as soot and dust, or formed through reactions of NOx, SOx, and ammonia. Routine measurements of these constituents are made at four sites in the valley, supplemented with more extensive measurements during intensive field studies. The pie chart on this slide shows the types of sources contributing to the annual average PM 2.5 levels in Bakersfield, the site with the highest concentrations. This reflects concentrations representative of peak drought conditions in 2013. This year was selected as the base year for the attainment demonstration to ensure that the strategy will adequately protect public health during drought conditions that are likely to occur more frequently due to man-made climate change. Carbon particles are the largest constituent, accounting for about 43% of annual levels. Smoke from fireplaces and wood stoves and commercial cooking are significant sources of this carbon, along with exhaust from mobile sources. Ammonium nitrate particles, shown on the left, account for about 37%, with mobile sources emitting about 85% of the NOx that forms ammonium nitrate. <clears throat> Other constituents include ammonium sulfate, which comes primarily from a variety of industrial sources, and fugitive dust from agricultural operations, construction activities, unpaved lots, and paved and unpaved roads. Next, let's look at peak daily PM 2.5 levels. Similar to the annual average, the highest daily PM 2.5 levels typically occur in Bakersfield. Highest concentrations occur during winter months when long periods without rainfall, coupled with cool temperatures and stagnant winds, lead to PM 2.5 levels that build up over days to weeks. Peak levels modeled in 2013 were 63 micrograms per cubic meter, nearly twice the level of the daily standard. While similar, similar constituents contribute to peak day concentrations, as shown in this pie chart, the proportions are different. The cold, stagnant conditions that occur during winter months are especially conducive to ammonium nitrate formation, which accounts for 51% of PM 2.5 particles. Carbon particles account for another 38% with enhanced contributions from residential wood burning. As with the annual average, ammonium sulfate and fugitive dust particles make up the remaining mass. The ambient measurements I just described define the key sources the attainment strategy needs to address. Air quality modeling then helps us evaluate the most effective approaches for achieving necessary reductions. This modeling integrates air quality and emissions data along with weather patterns to predict future air quality and identifies the magnitude and relative effectiveness of emission reductions needed for attainment. Building from existing control program, the core elements of the attainment strategy include five focus areas, consistent with near-term actions I discussed earlier. First, approaches to prevent wood smoke impacts on peak days by curtailing wood burning levels well below the daily standard, along with incentive programs to replace older wood burning devices. Second, new controls for commercial char broiling operations with an enhanced focus on, ur on the urban areas of Bra Bakersfield and Fresno. Third, minimizing dust from agricultural operations, as well as urban sources of dust, such as unpaved lots and parking areas, as well as paved roads. Fourth, aligning emission control requirements for stationary sources with the latest advances in control technologies. And fifth, new measures to establish requirements for the next generation of mobile source controls, along with incentive programs to enhance the deployment of these cleaner technologies 
within the time frames needed for attainment within the valley. In the remaining portion of the presentation, I'll provide additional details on each of these elements of the attainment strategy, starting with residential wood burning. Residential wood burning includes emissions from fireplaces and wood stoves and accounts for nearly one third of the PM 2.5 carbon particles measured on peak winter days. These smoke particles also contain toxic air contaminants. The map to the right shows the distribution of daily average winter emissions from wood burning with the darker red colors indicating higher emissions. Emissions are highest in urbanized areas, but also reflect a broad distribution throughout the valley, including in less densely populated areas. Reducing the localized impact of wood burning can provide significant health benefits. A recent study found that reductions in wood smoke from district programs to curtail wood burning had measurable health benefits. This, this study showed the, that hospitalization rates for heart disease declined over 15% since implementation of the district's wood burning curtailment program. Reductions in wood burning through curtailment programs and incentive programs for cleaner devices provides one of the most cost-effective approaches to achieving significant air quality benefits. These programs also provide important co-benefits by reducing exposure to air toxics as well as black carbon. Building on these efforts, new actions include continued replacement of older wood stoves and fireplaces with cleaner devices. The district's Burn Cleaner grant program has assisted Valley residents funding over 12,000 replacements to date. Over 75% of these have been to non-wood burning devices. Continued funding for this program will be important in supporting ongoing transition from wood burning. Other, other actions include consideration of expanding the wood, winter wood burning curtailment season beyond the current November through February timeframe and mandatory replacement of wood burning devices when homes are sold or remodeled. Finally, ARB staff has discussed with the district the need for strengthening the district's curtailment program to prevent all burning on days with concentrations greater than 20 micrograms to prevent the buildup of wood smoke that could lead to exceedances of the daily standard. This would eliminate provisions in the current rule that allow certain wood stoves to burn when con concentrations are above the standard, as well as wood burning devices outside of urban areas. Moving next to commercial charbroiling, which is responsible for 20 to 25 percent of PM 2.5 carbon particles year round. The map on the right side of this slide shows the spatial distribution of charbroiling emissions. As shown by the darker red colors, these emissions are concentrated in more populated urbanized areas of the valley, which can cr create localized health impacts. Emissions from commercial charbroiling are also continuing to grow along with the valley's population. The district has required controls for chain-driven charbroilers for a number of years. However, under-fire charbroilers, which are not currently regulated, account for the majority of emissions. Effective control technologies for under-fire charbroilers are now becoming available and have recently been demonstrated at one location of a national chain in the valley. Based on this success, these control technologies are now being installed at the chain's other valley locations. Proposed new actions would therefore require installation of controls for under-fire charbroilers in new, larger restaurants throughout the valley. These control technologies can reduce emissions by 75 to 85 percent. While, while the costs of these technologies have been decreasing, installation costs could be offset through incentive funding. The district is currently evaluating potential mechanisms for generating funding to support this effort. In addition to requirements for larger restaurants valley-wide, ARB staff is suggesting a strategic focus on, re on retrofits for additional restaurants in the Bakersfield and Fresno urban areas, which would provide additional benefits in the two regions of the valley with the highest PM 2.5 levels. ARB staff estimates this would affect about a third of the restaurants in these two cities. Focused retrofits in these, two, in these two areas would reduce localized impacts, and recent research suggests the control technologies would also reduce toxic emissions. Although the contribution of fugitive dust to PM 2.5 has typically been small, the drier conditions associated with droughts can increase dust emissions. Therefore, the district has proposed several new fugitive dust measures. These include replacement of almond harvesters with new technologies that significantly reduce the dust produced during almond harvesting and updating the Valley's Conservation Management Practices Regulation to include additional dust mi mitigation measures. In addition, 
ARB staff has identified the need to evaluate opportunities for reducing emissions from urban dust sources, such as unpaved open areas, unpaved parking lots, and paved road dust, particularly in the Bakersfield area. The district has also proposed a number of new measures to establish lower limits for other stationary sources. These reflect ongoing advancements in stationary source control technologies that are now feasible and cost effective. Specific measures include electrifying agricultural internal combustion engines, establishing lower NOx limits for non-ag stationary internal combustion engines, steam generators and boilers, installing ultra low NOx flare technologies, and establishing lower NOx and SOx limits for glass plants. As the primary corridor for transportation through the state, emission reductions from cars, trucks, and other mobile sources will have substantial benefits in the valley. While the current control program will continue to provide significant ongoing emission reductions, further reductions will be a key element of the valley's attainment strategy, as well as part of a broader effort to transform the transportation sector. These further reductions reflect a comprehensive suite of actions. New measures in the mobile source strategy adopted by the board in March will achieve reductions through development of more stringent engine standards, especially those for heavy duty trucks, requiring zero emission technologies in a variety of on-road and off-road applications, and adoption of new specifications for low emission diesel fuel. These regulatory efforts will be supplemented through incentive programs to accelerate turnover to these cleaner technologies, especially for heavy duty trucks and buses, tractors, and off-road equipment. ARB staff has also begun consideration of a new inspection and maintenance program for heavy duty trucks. This smog check type program could achieve significant reductions and ensure the trucks continue to remain as clean as possible throughout their useful life. Further reductions from ag tractors will continue to play a significant role in our efforts to reduce emissions from mobile sources. Incentive programs have been especially critical in this effort. Since 2009, over $400 million in private and public funding has been invested in the replacement of older agricultural tractors with newer, cleaner models. This funding has replaced over 5,000 Tier 0 and Tier 1 tractors to implement the ag equipment measure in the 2007 SIP. That measure established an emission reduction goal to be, to be achieved through incentives with the potential for regulatory action as a backstop. Incentive funding has achieved over nine tons per day of NOx reduction in 2017 and met the SIP goal. In addition, the district and, and the ag industry are working to implement a new tractor trade-up program to replace the oldest tractors with a cleaner used model. While incentive funding will be an important element going forward, a potential backstop rule could serve as an overall emission reduction target, while at the same time acting as a catalyst for attracting additional near-term investments. ARB staff has modeled the benefits of, me of the measures I've discussed in today's presentation, coupled with the significant reductions that will continue to accrue from current control programs as part of a comprehensive attainment strategy. This slide highlights predicted peak daily PM2.5 concentrations expected through implementation of the proposed measure. The bar to the left indicates 2013 PM2.5 levels in Fresno. The bar to the right shows the predicted future concentration with implementation of the measures identified to date. All sites with the exception of this one monitoring site in Fresno are projected to meet the 24-hour standard. As can be seen in the chart, the proposed strategy provides for significant reductions in both ammonium nitrate and carbon and brings Fresno within two micrograms of attaining the standard. This next slide shows a similar analysis, but now for the annual standard. The proposed strategy also provides for significant progress in reducing annual levels and brings almost all sites into attainment of the annual standard. The highest concentrations remain in the Bakersfield area, with a predicted concentration within one microgram of the standard. Again, the strategy provides for large reductions in ammonium nitrate and carbon. The measures included in the attainment strategy are ambitious and re will require significant efforts to implement. However, we are encouraged by these results, and experience tells us 
that we can identify the further reductions that will be needed to close the small remaining attainment gap. In the next few slides, I'll highlight a number of suggestions we have heard through our stakeholder outreach, as well as next steps in, refining, in further refining the strategy. We have heard from many stakeholders during the last several months, including those who live and work in valley communities that are most impacted by PM 2.5. With respect to mobile sources, community members have suggested that public fleets, zero emission school buses, and small ag equipment, and work over and, and drilling rigs be a potential focus of ARB's commitment to further reduce mobile source emissions. There is also strong interest in additional EV charging stations to better support the transition to zero emission vehicles. Suggestions to reduce directly emitted PM 2.5 include controls on biomass incinerators, boilers, and steam generators. Stakeholders have also suggested eliminating residential and agricultural burning and banning leaf blowing, with particular concerns about the localized impacts of these sources. Enhanced public education and outreach was also a common theme to support the overall effectiveness of individual programs. Finally, stakeholders have requested further evaluation of potential controls for ammonia, especially for dairies, which are the largest source of ammonia in the valley. We believe this evaluation is an important effort and needs to begin with additional research to improve our understanding of potential control options. ARB, working with other stakeholders, is beginning a comprehensive effort to address methane emissions from dairies as part of the short-lived climate pollutant plan. This provides an important opportunity to take a broader, integrated approach to evaluate both methane and ammonia emissions and the interaction between various control approaches. In the coming months, ARB will continue to work with the district to refine air quality modeling and identify potential approaches to close the small remaining attainment gap. This will include evaluating how the strategies identified so far can be further refined to maximize benefits as well as quantifying the emission reductions from several measures that have not yet been included in the modeling conducted to date. ARB and the district will also be reviewing the additional suggestions provided by stakeholders to develop the final comprehensive attainment strategy necessary to meet the health-based standards throughout the valley. As we move towards completing the attainment strategy, the timing of reductions from new measures will inform the valley's expected attainment dates. Maximizing the potential for near-term reductions will be a critical element of this effort. For example, strengthened requirements for residential wood burning can begin now, along with initial requirements for, for char commercial charbroiling, although a phased approach to implementation may be needed. Incentives for mobile sources can provide additional near-term reductions by accelerating the, over, the turnover to cleaner technologies. At the same time, there are significant reductions that will take some time to achieve as full implementation of the truck and bus rule occurs in the 2020 to 2023 timeframe. Development of a heavy duty truck I&M program would also begin in parallel. ARB and district staff's assessment of the phase in of the overall reductions needed for attainment therefore suggests that 2024 is the most feasible attainment date for the 24 hour standard and 2025 for the annual standard. However, as I noted above, this must be accompanied by a strong focus on achieving near-term reductions and immediate initiation of rulemaking efforts. In closing, staff will continue to work with the district on development of a comprehensive attainment strategy incorporating the proposed near-term actions I've described today. While the district has historically prepared separate plans for individual standards, we've been recommending an integrated planning approach and are optimistic that this can be done. After district action later this summer, we will bring district planning efforts back to, for your consideration this fall. Staff will also continue to work with the district on additional public outreach and workshops as part of this process. This concludes my presentation. I would now like to invite Shiraz Gill, Director of Strategies and Incentives for the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, to provide a few remarks. Good morning again, Chair and members of the board. Um, appreciate the presentation. We at the Air District would like to express our gratitude to Valley residents, Valley businesses, and ARB staff for participating in a very robust and effective public process over the last seven months. 
We have made significant progress in identifying control measures that move us closer to attain the PM2.5 standards. But our work is not done, and we still need to identify significant, significant additional emission reductions. Although we have worked very close well and well with our colleagues at ARB, we believe that maintaining a certain degree of tension and effort to hold each other accountable between the two agencies is healthy and needs to continue. We believe that the Valley residents and Valley businesses will be the real winners if both of our agencies continue to push each other and do the best that we can. A balanced attainment strategy that includes stationary source measures and mobile source measures and asks every sector of our economy to do the best that we can will not only be effective in improving public health for the Valley residents, but will also help improve economic effectiveness and, imp and feasibility by fairly distributing responsibility and costs. In that spirit, I am here to ask that ARB needs to do more to reduce NOx emissions from mobile sources. We still need to work with ARB to finalize the modeling, but even if we accept for the purpose of today's discussion the current modeling results that you saw today, uh, going from 37.1 micrograms to 35 for the daily standard requires approximately another 20 tons of NOx reductions per day for the daily standard, and going from 13 micrograms to 12 micrograms for the annual standard requires an even greater amount of NOx emission reductions, which is still quite challenging. Again, all of this is subject to final modeling and refinement, and we are continuing to work with the ARB staff to, um, to continue that effort. And as we continue the public process, we will come up with greater specificity and more details, but we would like to ask that the final plan include at least three components. First, with respect to the Volkswagen settlement revenues, we ask that ARB exercise full authority and influence to ensure that they direct a significant portion of the funds to the Valley. This is particularly important given that the San Joaquin Valley is home to the top 20 of the top 30 uh, disadvantaged communities in, uh, based on the Calavira screen. Second, we ask that in bringing this plan before your board that ARB explore every revenue source possible to help the Valley's disadvantaged communities by helping to reduce emissions in every sector, from heavy duty trucks and off-road equipment to reduce, uh, to reduce emissions from passenger vehicles through programs such as the Enhanced Fleet Moderniz Modernization Program. And looking for these fun funds, we ask that all sources be considered, including greenhouse gas funds that could provide co-benefits in the Valley's disadvantaged communities. Lastly, we need to replicate our great su success with respect to the agriculture tractors. In 2007, in recognition of the significant reductions needed in our attainment plan to address the eight-hour ozone standard, we worked very closely with the ARB and agriculture to include an aggressive commitment in our plan to achieve five to 10 tons of NOx per day by 2017 through a combination of incentives and or regulatory approach. The agriculture industry, the district, the USDA, NRCS work together on a concerted effort to generate a significant amount of funding and put together voluntary equipment replacement incentive program that reduce more emissions years ahead of that schedule. Thus far, this effort has invested over $500 million to date in public-private funding that has resulted in meeting that 10-ton threshold and way in advance getting over uh, at closely about 12 and a half tons of NOx uh, per day. We believe that for an incentive strategies like this to work effectively, a carrot and stick approach is always needed. We are committed to work on in bringing local and federal funding and ask that the state contributing, contribute funding as well towards this effort. But a regulatory backstop is also needed to make sure that everyone does their part and remains motivated to make it work. We can work out the details as the public process continues, but for a backstop to work, a sufficient compliance timeline will be needed to allow time to secure the funding for a project of this large scale. Our preference would be that a regulatory backstop be established in some form of contingency, would, uh, similar to the commitment that we did in the 2007 ozone plan, or perhaps similar to commitments including the South Coast AQMD's recently adopted AQMP that focused on an incentive-based strategy first. In closing, as presented by uh, ARB staff, the district has identified a long list of measures to reduce directly emitted PM2.5 emissions and NOx emissions. 
through our extensive public process. And the district remains committed to continue to search for new opportunities and additional measures as we move forward in the public process. And we really look forward to continue to work with ARB in this process. Thank you for allowing me time to comment. Thank you. And we appreciate the uh, collaboration and the progress that's been made. It's uh, undoubtedly a better product than before, particularly um, appreciate the district's willingness to step up on a increased commitment to working on stationary source measures that are under your control and understand that uh, ARB has a lot a lot of work to do here as well. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, the witnesses. We have a substantial list of people who've come to testify. Uh, so let's get started. The list is up on the board. So please uh, look at it yourselves and keep track of where you are. Um, we have a translator here. We introduced her earlier, but I'm not sure where she is. She, okay, yeah, great. So as needed, she can, she can come forward then. All right, beginning with um, number one, USDA. And if people would move forward in twos or threes, it's helpful just in terms of saving time as we wait for you all to come down to the front. Thanks. Good morning. Um, my name is Alan Forky. I'm uh, Assistant State Conservationist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Davis. My position is to manage Farm Bill program funding through Title II of the Farm Bill. Uh, conservation programs, we make funding available to farmers and ranchers throughout California. Beginning in 2002, with uh, additional funding made available through Title II, we were able to expand our focus to help landowners with air quality uh, issues. At that time, we focused primarily on replacement of uncontrolled stationary diesel combustion engines. Uh, we provided assistance to landowners who were willing to reduce their tillage operations to reduce PM10 emissions. Uh, we promoted smart sprayer technology, uh, road treatment. We even were um, uh, providing funding for proper disposal of uh, chemically treated grape stakes. For about the first four or five years of, of those farm bill dollars, we, we probably put five to six million dollars a year into those resource concerns, addressing uh, NOx emissions, particulate matter, and volatile organic compounds. In the 2009 farm bill, our opportunities were greatly expanded uh, to include uh, replacement of uncontrolled uh, mobile diesel combustion engines. In that year, we received $18 million worth of funding. We were able to partner with the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District to leverage funds totaling $21 million to replace close to 500 uh, uncontrolled diesel combustion engines. Since that time, our funding has been considerable. Uh, when the funding was first earmarked into the Farm Bill and made available for specifically air quality, uh, due to the criteria that was developed uh, and how that funding was allocated nationally, uh, just based largely on the degree of environmental regulations being imposed upon landowners, California received about two-thirds to three-quarters of the funding. Since 2009, we have replaced over 3,300 uncontrolled diesel combustion engines for on farm use uh, statewide. About 2,600 of those have been in the San Joaquin Valley. And we've provided funding uh, in excess of $162 million just in our tractor replacement program. Uh, overall, we have provided approximately $200 million worth of funding in air quality since that time. Now, the future of this is that the 2014 Farm Bill was funded through 2018. We received $21.5 million in 2000. You please go ahead and finish. Okay, $21.5 million in 2017, and we are in the process of obligating those dollars, which we have to do by the end of September. Uh, it is highly likely that we will continue to receive these funds in 2018, and then depending upon what happens in the next Farm Bill, we will hopefully have enough funding to continue this initiative uh, 
through the remainder of um, the next five to ten years. Uh, that's impressive. Thank you. Um, I would uh, just ask you to explain what you replace these older vehicles with. Uh, well, the criteria is uh, they have to, the old engines have to be replaced uh, by a current year techno current tier technology. So when we started in 2009, we were replacing with tier three technology, uh, and now we're replacing them with tier four. And it is a requirement that the old equipment must be destroyed. So uh, we're basically taking the old tractors off the market and replacing them with cleaner, cleaner uh, running engines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Adenike Adeyeye, and I'm a research and policy analyst at Earth Justice and also a steering committee member of the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition, or CVAC, where everyone is from, it seems like. Um, so I would just like to say thank you so much for the presentation, um, for uh, Shiraz, for your, for your comments, and then also for the opportunity to speak. Um, we definitely support a lot of what um, ARB and the district are putting forward in these plans. Um, we support the idea of developing requirements, in particular for um, zero emission technologies, um, support some of the, the, the recommendations from stakeholders, like investing more in electrification, in electric vehicle chargers, and electrifying school buses, and small ag equipment. I think those are really important points that um, should be considered by your board and by staff moving forward. And also, I should have said, um, because everyone else is going to be speaking so extensively on you know, the fireplace rule, charbroiling, et cetera, I'm going to focus on transportation. Um, so I think that those issues are very important to us. We look forward to working with ARB and with the district more on that. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to point out are that um, we really think the focus should be on zero emission because ARB has recognized that that is the way that we need to move forward to meet current and future air quality standards and to protect public health. Um, the uh, in the rare cases where people are not able to invest in zero emission equipment, uh, we think that ARB should focus on near zero emission equipment with the definition of near zero being that equipment can um, can operate for some period of miles fully zero emission. Um, we do not support moving forward with, well, moving forward um, with investments in equipment that perpetuates traditional combustion technology and that will never fully get us to zero. So investing in future diesel, investing in additional natural gas um, doesn't really meet the requirements that California has moving forward. Um, I would also say finally that incentives are, are great and important. Carrots and sticks are great. Um, you need a stick to make a carrot work. And uh, we think it's very important that ARB and the district focus on regulations that will encourage people to, um, to take advantage of incentives when they exist. And we'd also like to remind you all that um, the Clean Air Act doesn't allow for incentives to just qualify as emission reductions for PM 2.5. There's no black box here. So we really need to have the emissions in hand and the, re the regulations that will produce those emissions in hand um, when developing this plan. So to the extent that you can focus on regulations paired with incentives to, to advance attainment, that would, be, that would be good for public health and for, for meeting the Clean Air Act standards. So thank you again for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Janet Diaz. I'm Janet Dietz Kamei. I have asthma. I live uh, in uh, the San Joaquin Valley where the worst air in the United States exists. I moved there with my husband in 2003. In three years, I have asthma. I cannot go outside except on days when the air quality is registered on the RON system as good. If I go out, I can't breathe. I start coughing. I'm unable to get an air, a breath of air, and I struggle to breathe something like a fish out of water. I'm not the only one there. There are thousands of us that live in the San Joaquin Valley with asthma, and that population continues to grow. Children are unable to go outside. Children go to school with inhalers so they can breathe. The air is absolutely toxic, 
and those of us who live there suffer. In the winter months, when we have PM 2.5, it's very high, and I am only able to go outside after it rains, and then for only about a half a day after it rains, wood burning fills the air with PM 2.5 once again. I am an outdoor person. This past year, we did have more rain, but uh, I still was only able to go out a few days during the months of March, December, January, and February, and even part of March, because then ag burning began, and the air was filled with PM 2.5, black carbon, that I and the other asthmatics in the San Joaquin Valley cannot breathe. It's a frightening thing, because what can happen to those of us with asthma is we can die. Many of us end up in the emergency room, including children. Children are born, we have many cases of underweight children being born, as if, just as if we were all heavy smokers. Children have developmental problems due to the fact that they have asthma. This is a serious situation, and it needs to be addressed urgently. The strictest way we can to get to where we, those of us with asthma can go outside and actually enjoy being outside must be done. My recommendation is during the winter months, we ban burning in urban areas. Absolutely ban them. That way we can enforce if people are using their fireplaces, both inside and outside fireplaces. That would be a quick fix and a very inexpensive fix to reduce the PM 2.5 in our air. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, board members and Chair Nichols. My name is Grecia Lenes, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Now, um, our organization works with um, over 20 communities across the Central Valley, um, much, most of which are found in these low-income, um, very impacted and burdened communities um, that are ranked very high here in the state and even nationally. Um, and so we, we work with dedicated community leaders fighting to give their families a better future because they know how severe their air quality is and they know how it impacts their families' day-to-day day -day lives. Um, we are thankful that, they are, that the ARB has stepped in and, and worked with the district to um, make sure that we are able to reach the attainment that we need for our communities to be able to thrive and succeed. And, um, and we would like to see the ARB and the district take this a step further to create more stringent regulations um, to further re reduce PM 2.5 and um, reduce the emissions that we need to see. Um, we need to see stationary sources that contaminate lace and be and be relocated nowhere near our schools, nowhere near communities, because most of these time, most of the times, they're only found in low-income um, communities of color. We need to make sure that um, mobile sources uh, are further regulated to make sure we have cleaner tractors, um, trucks, etc. And additionally, we route diesel trucks away from communities so they can breathe better. Um, last, uh, our our valley, our valley needs these stringent regulations, as as Chair Nichols mentioned our case is very severe and we need these to happen fast and soon to to really address the concerns that that the community has um, lastly I would like to thank the ARB's responsiveness at last week's um, uh, workshop in Fresno we uh, there was a comment made where we requested that the material be provided in Spanish and we see that here today so we are very grateful for that it, it's a very small step but it, it makes a huge difference for a lot of the members um, when they come to these events to feel included and be able to, to see the material. Um, but yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Earl White. I'm from the Central Valley. I am. Um, I have interest here due to good air is good for everybody. Also, I believe excitement drives the market. So as a businessman, I believe the market would be help from the board, the, the Air Resource Board, because that you know, new product, I mean, new product line means growth for industry, means growth for the American people, and new job creations. 
And uh, reduction is great. And reduction since the 80s, since I grew up, has come a long way. I remember seeing cars with tailpipes. You know, there's black smoke coming out. And due to regulation, it has improved the air quality of all Californians. And so, you know, it had been a good job by everybody who was involved. So I'd like to say thank you for everybody who takes the time out to help clean air. There could be more could be done. And as a businessman, I believe through industry, we can do a, a large amount through distributing, you know, reduction electric cars or, you know, more environmentally safe cars, solar power, and other green improving initiatives. Thank you and have a nice day. Hi, uh, my name is Sorelli Morales. I am from the rural part of Fresno. And um, we're basically surrounded by different sources of PM 2.5, which includes agricultural tractors, animal feedlots, um, to chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Um, I want to thank you guys for regulating more the landfills and the gases that emits, reducing one source of PM25 within like our communities. However, um, there's still so much sources that are affecting the health of our community and the individuals living there, including children's, which their health is declining every day and at this moment. So I urge you to regulate other sources as well, not just focused on one, and also to um, push forward these regulations that benefit the individuals and these communities rather than large corporations and um, industries. So thank you. Hello, my name is Tom Helm. Um, I am from a nonprofit called Valley Improvement Projects in Modesto, which is part of CVAC. I also sit on the EJAG, uh, the Air District for Stanislaus County. Um, and I want to first say that I support and appreciate uh, all of the work uh, done here at ARB as well as the Air District. And I appreciate uh, Shiraz being here and his comments and all the work um, that's done on all sides. Uh, I agree that uh, sometimes a little tension in the relationship is a good thing and between uh, community activists and the Air District is also a good thing too to have that tension. Uh, so uh, I, like I said, I appreciate all the work they do um, and, and as we all know, there's still much more that can be done. Um, to point out something that was in the uh, presentation a minute ago, the Air District workshops, uh, those four um, public workshops that I believe I was at at least three of them, if not all four, and I don't think any of them, correct me if I'm wrong, were uh, in the evening or weekend uh, at a time uh, outside of regular working hours. And um, as an uh, environmental justice advocate, I try to do outreach in our environmental justice communities uh, in Modesto and Stanislaus. Um, and it's very hard to get uh, people that uh, have a regular job Monday through Friday, you know, 8 to 5, to be able to make it to a meeting that's on a Tuesday at 2 p.m. or a Wednesday at 10 uh, a.m. or something like that. Um, and a couple of these communities, just to share for an example, uh, the airport district in Modesto uh, is in the top 1% of uh, disadvantage, disadvantaged communities, according to Cal Screen. Um, it's right next to the airport, why it's called the airport neighborhood, uh, to the east, to the west, you have uh, Gallo, which includes the Gallo Glass facility. Um, and to the north, you actually have Yosemite, which was built uh, with a pipeline for canneries. So you constantly have the trucks coming in and out of those uh, line of canneries, uh, all in the same neighborhood. And uh, to give you another example, about in the airport district, about half of the population does not have a high school diploma. Uh, so I challenge somebody to find uh, somebody that doesn't have a high school diploma that has a job that lets them out you know at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday to go and attend a, a public meeting to talk about the uh, air quality uh, the other environmental justice community in Stanislaus is on the west side of the county 
which has a variety of uh, emitting sources from the trucks coming in and out because of the ag industry um, to uh, the growing number of distribution centers uh, out near Patterson on the west side of the county that are uh, more are being built. I'm sorry, just take another couple of seconds. Okay. Um, to uh, the trash incinerator that's also uh, in the west side of the county, which um, admits, uh, admits just as much NOx as all of Chevron's facilities put together in the valley. Uh, the more direct 2.5 than three coal plants combined. Um, and okay. thank oh. you, especially since you're reading. Could you please? <laughs> yes, I will. thank you. I, I will all end right. it there. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Mr. Martin. Okay. I'm Ronald Martin. I'm on the executive committee of the Tehipiti chapter of the Sierra Club in Fresno, and I'm here to encourage the board to speed up the regulation of burning by eliminating burning. Uh, as a boy, it was my chore to burn trash. I took it out to a 55-gallon drum and lit it up with a match, uh, and then that was outlawed, and that was that was a bad thing to do. Uh, hi hikers and campers are encouraged not to burn anymore. Uh, don't have a campfire when you go out in the wilderness. Bring a portable gas stove. As there are more and more people in California, we need to stop burning. Uh, and that goes for fireplaces. Uh, it ought to be completely outlawed. That would be much easier to enforce to just have no burning at all. Um, Fireplaces are there for recreational or decorative purposes, not really for home heating. We don't need all that much home heating in the valley, which is a warm place anyway. I've gone through many Januaries with just leaving the heater completely off. I wore a coat in the house. People can do that. Uh, and with climate change, it's going to be even less and less necessary to have heating with uh, burning. And that the same goes for agricultural burning. There shouldn't be any burning of uh, agricultural waste. Now it does take more people to um, chip and compost agricultural waste, but we want to create jobs. That's why President Trump was elected, because people prioritize the creation of jobs. If they can create more of these jobs in the agricultural sector by eliminating burning, that'll be good. Uh, if, if the businesses can't survive, because they have to pay these costs, well, any regulation will have impacts on business, maybe even driving some of them out of business. But prices may have to go up. But if people aren't willing to pay the full cost of a product, including the price of uh, clean production, then that means people really don't want it, and the business shouldn't exist. And as for uh, char boiling and restaurant uh, burning, um, that needs to be controlled possibly even eliminated um, in the valley, possibly with the population we have, maybe those dishes can't be enjoyed anymore because uh, we don't want to breathe the PM 2.5. PM 2.5 may have killed my mother. She got pneumonia in January, uh, probably because of breathing in particles. She got over the pneumonia, but she went into decline, and by June she died. So. We really do need to eliminate the PM 2.5 by eliminating all the burning in the valley. Thank you. Dr. Bombs? Yes, I want to take this opportunity to uh, introduce um, Sarah Sharp, and I think she's brought along some um, folks to speak with her. Sarah, well, first of all, you've heard me talk in the past about the research that I'm involved with in Fresno and the San Joaquin Valley. It's funded through both uh, NIH and EPA. Uh, it's a Children's Environmental Health Center. <laughs> and uh, Sarah has been instrumental in um, an important component of our work, which is community outreach and translation. And in particular, we've been working with a magnet high school in um, Fresno, uh, CART. And uh, I think Sarah is going to uh, mention that. Anyway, I'm very pleased Definitely. to ha introduce Sarah Sharp. That is me. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Nichols and the board. Uh, I know most of you, and th to those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm from Fresno. I've been working in this field for now 
10 to 15 years. Uh, currently wear two hats and one of them Dr. Baldwin's just mentioned. I will be making some comments for my other job uh, first. Uh, so I work for Central California Asthma Collaborative as the Associate Director uh, along with Kevin Hamilton who is our Executive Director and he has served in many committees um, for ARB and at the Air District. So we first wanted to thank both the board, both uh, the district and the Air ARB staff who have worked with us extensively over the last six months. I think we've seen Karen and a lot of the other staff in Fresno so much this last six months. It's been fun. Um, but we, and we agree with what Tom and Shiraz, what Shiraz said and Tom's agreement that you know we, there is a great value in holding tension between all of the different uh, stakeholder groups. Um, we continue to request accelerated efforts for PM 2.5 reductions. Uh, even if we aren't going to meet the goals for attainment, we still want to see those reductions as soon as possible because we know of the health impacts and the health improvements we would see if we uh, take measures early. Uh, we have resp respectfully request that ARB advance the timeline for mobile source strategy to ensure that Valley Knox strat uh, targets are hit before 2023. Um, and we are also looking, we've been very grateful to, for your te technical expertise, uh, but we are still requesting additional modeling about ammonia. We've seen the modeling for 30% reductions in ammonia, but as my executive director has been working for the last 10, 15 years on dairy emission concerns and uh, the health impacts as an irritant and as a PM 2.5 precursor, we really wanted to see at least the modeling for what more reductions in ammonia would get us. Um, even if it's not a realistic goal. We would like to see those um, at least 70% reduction in ammonia. And um, lastly, I think I've said this to almost everybody here, if you've ever seen me speak, that we still want an ag equipment rule. We appreciate what we have gotten with incentives. Um, I've come before this board for many years asking for an ag equipment rule is one of the last unregulated uh, sources of uh, NOx that we are aware of. So we, we believe that it's time to start phasing in a rule um, and g continue moving on with incentives as we have. And we would like to also see the inventory on that. So with that, I'm going to close that CCAC comment um, and introduce, to, we brought two students here from, it's a Fresno Clovis school that um, focuses the Center on Advanced Re Research and Technology, and they'll talk more about their program, but that's what I've, I've been working with them uh, through the CHAPS study and Thank through you. our Community Outreach and Translation Core. Thank you. Hello, my name is Destiny Luna. I'm a student at Sunnyside High and the Center for Advanced Research and Technology. My partner Sam will tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the focus of our spring semester project was to learn more about environmental issues and getting some field research while doing so. And our we were focused on air quality and what made us so concerned about air quality is the fact that Samantha and I were both born and raised in Fresno and we both have asthma. And we didn't realize to the extent of the problem that it actually was for not only us, but for the rest of the San Joaquin Valley. And um, our project was based on an experiment conducted by CHAPS um, in the fall semester. And it was testing um, we, they were trying to find out where students in the Fresno metropolitan area were most exposed to black carbon. And uh, in doing so, they tested um, with volunteers, um, which were students. They tested this technology called the AMAS, and that stands for Automated uh, Microenvironment Aerosol Sampler. And what it does is draws in air, and it detects the amount of black carbon that is in the surrounding areas. And what makes it different than the old technology was the fact that it is able to differentiate which microenvironment the subject is in. And basically meaning it was able to tell whether or not the student was at school, at home, or other, which was considered transit. And that means it was accounting for everywhere that was not home or school for the students. And the result was that we, um, the data supported our hypothesis. Um, Sam and I thought that transit would be the microenvi microenvironment in which we were most exposed to air pollution, um, specifically black carbon. And the AMAS had four different filters, um, one for home, one for school, and then one for transit, and one was left blank. And it was um, quite amazing to see 
that we spent the least amount of time um, in transit. However, that is where we were most exposed to air pollution. And we spent the most time at home, which um, is also where we were least exposed to um, black carbon. And I just want to invite you to continue doing what you have been doing and keeping these regulations up to par and or better so that we can hopefully meet the standards, uh, the national standards for our air quality. And I hope you would also do that through community outreach, um, like some of the workshops that have been done. Um, but also, like um, it was mentioned earlier, keep in mind most people are working from a eight to five job and it's kind of hard to come out at such a fun time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so. we, we do try to hold uh, workshops and hearings in uh, all areas w uh, in the evening hours when, when we do get out into the community. So I know sometimes you have to do it during the hours that you can get um, officials uh, also to participate. But we definitely understand that uh, if you want to reach the community, you have to go where people are. Thank you. Um, for those of you who do not know uh, what CART is, it is um, it stands for Center of Advanced Research and Technology. Um, the, this is a school only for juniors and seniors, and um, me and Destiny both attend there from eight from seven thirty to ten thirty a.m. And then we go to a different school. I attend Fresno High, and she attends Edison High School. Sunnyside. Sunnyside High School. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, this school um, allows us to. Um, take a course we're interested in like our future career. Um, right now we're both taking environmental science. Actually, Destiny is finished. She's a senior. She's graduated. Um, uh, through this, through the environmental science lab, we got the opportunity to work with um, Sarah and Chaps. And we got to um, understand what is in our air and how it impacts us. And um, through the research that we've done, um, it has really um, brought me to understand that our air needs help. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Questions? Anybody? Comments? We appreciate your coming. Thank you. I was just, I was oh, just going to thank Dr. Destiny Sheriff, and Sam you, for yeah. a nice testimony. Dr. Sheriff, do you have a comment? No, I just, uh, th this is such a wonderful example of citizen student scientists. And uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we won't tell your school you're here. Uh, <laughs> I've got a doctor's excuse credit. for you if you need it. I've got two doctor's <laughs> excuses. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, w w wonderful uh, experiment, uh, very provocative. Uh, Boy, we need more things like this. Thank you. And we're actually going to use that pilot data for the next phase of our study. It was very important. Great. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Nayamin Martinez y yo soy miembro de CIVAC y de la Red de Justicia Ambiental del Centro de California. Okay. Hello, my name is Nayamin Martinez and I am a member of CIVAC and also uh, a perdón, ¿cuál es? Red de Justicia Ambiental del Centro de California. Oh, okay. What? Excuse the interpreter, it's a very long and no acronym. CCJA. Yeah. Um, primero, gracias por tener un intérprete y gracias por tener los materiales en español. Eso ayuda mucho. Thank you for uh, providing an interpreter and uh, for translating the materials in Spanish. That helps a lot. La razón que estoy aquí el día de hoy es porque en la contaminación del aire me ha afectado personalmente. The reason that I am here today is because uh, the air uh, contamination has affected me greatly. Not lately. Greatly. Oh. Um, <laughs> yo nací en la Ciudad de México, que si ustedes no lo saben, tiene una de las peores calidades del aire de todo el mundo. Uh, I was born in the city of Mexico. If you don't know about it, uh, it is a city that has the worst air quality uh, compared to any other place in the in the world. En el año 2000 me mudé a Fresno porque mi marido comenzó a trabajar en la Universidad Estatal de Fresno y fue muy 
increíble para mí saber que estaba cambiándome al lugar donde también el aire estaba muy contaminado. Uh, in 2000, my husband started working uh, in, in Fresno, so we moved to Fresno. Uh, he worked for the University of Fresno. I was uh, highly unaware about uh, the air quality contamination. 17 años después, ahora tengo un hijo que desde los dos años fue diagnosticado con asma y con severas alergias. And, uh, For uh, 17 years later, I have a son uh, since uh, the age of two has been diagnosed uh, with uh, severe asthma and several allergies. A pesar de que le gusta hacer actividad física, no lo puede hacer constantemente por la calidad del aire. Así que solo está contando los días para que en tres años se pueda ir de Fresno cuando vaya a la universidad. Um, now he, he does like to keep himself active, however, uh, he is counting the days, uh, three more years before he can leave uh, the city of Fresno, so he can attend university elsewhere. Y la razón que estoy aquí también es porque no afecta a mi hijo, afecta a cuatro millones de personas que vivimos en el Valle Central. Uh, now, I'm not here just for my son. Uh, this also affects uh, three other million people who live in the Central Valley. Y en particular, afecta a personas que viven en áreas donde hay muchas fuentes de contaminación, como las personas que viven en la comunidad de Calowa y del sureste de Fresno. Now, the people in Calowa and the south uh, east of Fresno are the people, in my opinion, who seem more affected by it. Y solo voy a compartir tres ejemplos. En esa comunidad hay una fábrica de vidrio, hay una, una incineradora de biomasa y hay muchos centros de distribución. Ok, y just for example, there is a glass factory in that area. There's also a uh, distribution plant. Y, perdón, biomasa. Centros de distribución. Ah, este, una incineradora de biomasa. And also an incinerator, a uh, biomass incinerator. Es la que se llama Río Bravo. Allí están trayendo todos los árboles de las montañas. En vez de traerlos de allí, porque también están usando camiones, tractores que tienen diésel y contaminan, deberían hacer estas plantas en las montañas. Um, they bring uh, the trees uh, from the mountains, and I think uh, instead of bringing the trucks, diesel trucks, and other uh, contaminators, they should keep them up in the mountains. Y las plantas las deberían de poner también fuera de las comunidades, por ejemplo, donde los agricultores puedan llevar sus desechos agrícolas y no quemarlos para seguir contaminando el aire. I think the compost should also go elsewhere and um, the, the farmers shouldn't have to uh, do the compost in, within the community, but outside of the community. Gracias y espero que las regulaciones que pongan sean más estrictas para mejorar la calidad del aire. Thank you so much, and I really hope that the regulations that you impose are actually more strict in order to benefit the air quality. Thank you. Next uh, person on our list. Cesar? Oh, yes, there you go. Uh, hello, my name is Cesar Aguirre, and I come with CVAC, representing the Central California Environmental Justice Network. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for the helping hand you're extending, uh, especially uh, being a resident of Kern. In November of 2015, the Kern County Supervisors approved a, a blanket a use of the infrastructure to oil and gas companies in 2015. Jerry Brown, in August of 2015, Jerry Brown fired a uh, oil and gas regulators under the pressure of Occidental, and uh, during the the campaign, Democrats said that they were pro fracking, and with 80 percent of the oil production of California coming out of Kern County, I would uh, again like to say thank you for your help because you know we don't have a lot of support at home, uh, so we have to come out to other people. Uh, as, as far as PM 2.5 goes, uh, it's affected my family. Uh, me and my brother grew up in the Coachella Valley, and we don't have any respiratory issues or problems. However, my, we've lived uh, here for 13 years, and that's how long how, that's how old my sister is. She, however, does have respiratory issues and several other things that um, we need to be careful with her about. Um, 
I can sympathize with people in the Valley because of my sister's situation. And I know some of you may not be able to sympathize because you have not gone through this, but I brought testimony so that you can empathize with the people and see what they're going through. Uh, one of the main problems that I saw was that pro uh, people were against small producers because uh, producers are exempt from a lot of the regulations. Uh, one uh, testimony that I'm bringing from a, a man named Francisco who lives in a street called Nelson Corps in Arvin, California, he says, I can feel, uh, I shouldn't be able to feel the dirt going into my nostrils when I breathe. I shouldn't be able, or I shouldn't be scared to let my wife go out uh, to be able to breathe this. I shouldn't be scared to wear white clothes because my nose will start uh, dripping blood due to the dirty air. I shouldn't be scared to raise children or bring over my grandchildren to this environment. Uh, this man lives near a uh, gas uh, storage tank. Um, there's a, a lot in his community. For example, there is a gas storage tank that is 200 feet from an apartment complex with over 100 families. It's next to a Clinica Sierra Vista, and it's right next to a dentist um, office. Uh, it is labeled a small producer, which means that because it makes less than 6,000 barrels a day, it is exempt from these regulations. Uh, people in the community are asking for strict regulations because of this, um, for this, because, you know, they, they don't have anywhere else to go. Uh, the second thing that was echoed in the community is buffer zones. People live uh, right next to got oil and gas productions, and some sometimes the diesel engines from the pumps keep people uh, uh, awake. So one thing they want is uh, buffer zones as well. Uh, so yeah, I'd just like to finish with uh, telling you guys, let's focus on what we can control. I know somebody mentioned that in 2013, there was a drought, and that caused a lot of problems. But also in 2013, 80 billion, barrel, or 80 billion gallons of water was used in the oil wastewater pits. And those were open air. So you know, Thank you. let's focus on what we can control. Thank you. Hello, good morning. My name is Angela Isas, and I am an intern at the Central California Asthma Collaborative, and I'm here representing CVAC. And I am a future summer grad student that will be graduating this summer from, from the Cal California State University of Fresno with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Public Health. And I am here to show my full support in the collaborative planning of ARB and the district for the PM 2.5 state implement, implementation plan. And I'm honored as well to be in front of the ARB board as I have studied you extensively in the CSU Fresno um, curriculum for public health. And I'm here to also um, mention that I am in full support to put stringent rules against mobile sources and also ammonia emissions, um, especially towards chemical fertilizers and pesticides. As right now, I am doing my research report on the issues with um, law enforcement and mitigation strategies um, amongst chlor the chloropyrifos being used in fields and that are among farm laborers, as my parents are both farm laborers, and I as well have been a farm laborer myself for a short period of time and have experienced um, just the smallest amount of what the air quality and also what chemical fertilizers and pesticides can do towards um, someone's health, as my father has congestive heart failure, and also he has obstructive sleep apnea. Um, so I'm, I'm here to show my full support. I'm still learning currently on all the air pollution regulations as that is one of my future career paths to kind of just be able to be a part of um, striving to, to fully just be able to control all the air pollution that is currently um, high in the Central Valley. And also if my career path fully allows me to be a part of that road and to be able to successfully lower the air pollution in our Central Valley, I would be more than honored to just be a part of it and also strive to build a better California and a better, a better Central Valley. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thomas Menz. I'm from the uh, urban area of Fresno County. I want you to imagine for a moment that you had boarded a flight and you were strapped into your seat and the plane takes off and you begin to smell smoke. 
and you look around and you notice that a passenger adjacent to you has lit up a cigarette. So you summon the flight attendant and you say, something has to be done about this. This guy's smoking a cigarette. And this is the response you receive. Sir, we're very concerned for your health. We're going to do everything in our power. In fact, we will leave no stone unturned in our efforts to ameliorate your health concerns. But please understand that the um, complaint that you speak of is highly localized. So what we've done is we've installed a PM25 monitor uh, in one of the forward cabins, as it happens. And um, when the ambient levels reach 20 micrograms per cubic meter of air, we will inform all of those passengers smoking cigars, unfiltered cigarettes, pipes to extinguish their smoking devices. And when uh, ambient levels reach 65 micrograms, then we'll ask those who are smoking uh, low tar cigarettes and are vaping to extinguish those as well. Well, that's, that's crazy. I mean, that's a hell of a way to run an airline, isn't it? Maybe not the worst example of airline behavior we've heard in recent news, but um, nonetheless, this is not an adequate response. And yet, and yet, lest the analogy, the parallel is lost on some of those here, that is very much the response of those who are stewarding our flight through the filthy Fresno winter air. That's very much their response to the, uh, to the problems that we face as regards residential wood burning. Um, now, your staff has modeled that if residential wood, wood burning were to be completely curtailed um, in Fresno, four micrograms of reduction overall for the year. I mean, that would go all the way toward meeting this um, supposedly unattainable goal of the Clean Air Act. In Bakersfield, I believe it's uh, two micrograms, which would again m you know, meet the requirements of the Clean Air Act. So the banning of, there are some things that are just so inherently bad are just so inherently unhealthful and harmful to other people that we ban them in public spaces. And I submit that residential wood burning, which has many of the same, you know, sort of problems with it, if you look at the constituents of that smoke as cigarette smoke, it has no more role in our urban environment than your, would Your might. time is up, sir. I'll need you to wrap up, up a please. cigarette in a public meeting place. So I wish you would consider that, and I thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Genevieve Gale. I work with the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition and I also represent the Coalition for Clean Air on this PM 2.5 plan. I'd l first like to say, wow, <laughs> we've come a long way. Um, back in October, we were told that there was nothing more that could be done and that we just needed more time. And now we stand here today saying that we can reach attainment and we can do it in five to seven years. And I want to thank you all for that. This progress lies on your shoulders for refusing to approve an inadequate plan and continuing this cycle of rejection, delay, and dirty air. air. Um, this progress is also thanks to your amazing staff. Um, they have made themselves extremely accessible and willing to answer all of our questions. And we have a lot of questions. So um, I, I, I definitely appreciate all of the work that you have put into this. Um, I'd also like to say I too have, have done a lot of public outreach. I have gone to many a meetings in the past, the past six months. I've met with mothers in Kalwa, as Nayameen had, uh, had described and um, who have children with asthma and live in the shadow of a biomass incinerator. I've also met with farm workers who are extremely concerned about open agricultural burning and also the other things that get thrown in that pile. Um, I've also met with a pregnant woman who is very, very concerned about her unborn child, churchgoers who are concerned about the environmental racism that occurs in our cities. Um, and a wife who had to move into the mountains because her husband can no longer live on the valley floor. Um, 
Moving forward, I would like to say that there is still more work that needs to be done. We've, we've gone a long way. We still have some remaining um, asks concerning the data. We would really like to see, as Sarah had said, um, the ammonia modeling. I think that's really important to see um, what kind of reductions we could get. Uh, we'd also um, would like to see the agricultural equipment inventory to be made public. We're really excited to hear that, that we've made so much progress and that um, incentives are working, but we would like to see the data that backs up that statement and to see what kind of regulation could uh, get us further. Um, and I also would like to say that we need to include contingency measures. That hasn't been spoken of today. It's been something that the, our local district has not included in many of its plans, and it's a needed part of the attainment plan. So banning burning, we know, would get us there. So let's keep that in mind. But in closing, I want to thank this agency for all the work that they have done um, and remind you that you are our last offense. We have a district that is trying to roll back protections in the Clean Air Act, and we have a federal government that seems willing to do such a thing. So um, we, we rely on you to protect the public health of the Valley, and I thank you for all of your work. Hello, uh, Tom Franz. Um, I'm not representing the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee for AB 32, but I'm a member. Um, but I'm representing the um, Central Valley Air Quality Coalition as a steering committee member and the Kern Coahuila chapter of the Sierra Club as an uh, executive board member there. Um, I want to I I start by thanking Kurt Caparos for testifying so eloquently in Washington last month on behalf of the Clean Air Act. Uh, it, going up against our own air district, who was there to to gut the Clean Air Act and make a meeting like this almost moot, you know. Uh, so thank you, Kurt, and and to the Air Resources Board for continuing to insist on that we make progress. Um, you have uh, AB 197, which is both a mandate and and authority to do direct actions in places like the San Joaquin Valley to not only reduce greenhouse gases, but to get those co-benefits of things like PM 2.5 and, 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 and NOx reductions. So I'm here to ask you to use that, not just in a refinery measure, but to help us clean our air by uh, doing something like, like this. Uh, in Kern County, the production of steam and boilers is one of the biggest overall stationary sources of pollution that we face. Uh, it takes a massive amount of steam to get the oil out of Kern County oil fields. So, and they're burning natural gas for the most part to make that steam. You could mandate under AB 197 a 50% reduction in greenhouse gases from the production of steam in Kern County by 2030. And we know that solar can make steam. Solar can heat water, direct solar, concentrated solar. They, they should immediately be transitioning to that method of making their steam, eliminating all those NOx emissions that we so badly need in, the, in that part of the valley. And, and we need that mandate, mandate from you uh, under this, in the scoping plan. And then that directly gets at this problem in a way you can't, maybe, maybe can't do otherwise. Same with internal combustion engines that are pumping irrigation water throughout the San Joaquin Valley still. You could mandate by 2025 under AB 197 that every internal combustion engine that's within three to 500 feet of a electrical power source convert to electricity. Now you can use incentive money initially, but there's gotta be a mandate by this date, by 2025. It's gonna help clean our air. Uh, there are thousands of these pumps still running. Some of them old diesel engines. Some of them newer, cleaner, natural gas. But we gotta stop the emission of the uh, greenhouse gases and we gotta stop the NOx emissions as well that come side by side. So, so use your authority in every way you can to help us clean our air, thank you. Good morning, I'm Dolores Weller and I'm the director for the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition. Uh, just wanted to uh, 
say that I am you know, very appreciative of uh, the board's direction in, at the October meeting. As others have stated, this is uh, an unprecedented process that sort of shifted things for us. And that's why we're all here. And I, I think that um, you might be curious, you know, why are we all here instead of, you know, voicing our concerns directly to the Air District? And I think that we have felt that our concerns are not addressed. And so we, we do look to you as, as sort of that, that safeguard to, to uh, ensure that our concerns are addressed in this PM 2.5 plan. As others have stated, um, you know, we've been going through a, a long uh, public process, and so we appreciate staff uh, coming to the Valley. Uh, the, the workshop that was held last week was in the evening, well attended. Um, so we really appreciate staff and, and also addressing all of our questions throughout this planning process. Um, something that has come out of, of, of the, the workshops and also our own community outreach um, is, is the, are the issues of localized impacts that others have raised. That there are, you know, we have a strategy to, to reach attainment, or, you know, we're trying to make the, the monitors read well, but then there are also those uh, impacts to local, local communities and that may be, you know, small producers for oil and gas. They fall through the cracks, the, the regulations don't apply, but it's a localized impact. And so I think that's something that needs to be reconciled and possibly could be addressed in, you know, potential uh, changes to, um, you know, measures that, that the district uh, implements um, in this plan. Um, I also want to talk about the timeline. I know we're on a really short timeline here and that your board will be seeing uh, a completed plan in September. So we do uh, want to stress that we want to see a completed, uh, the completed modeling data in order to move forward. We have, we outlined uh, some measures that we wanted to see in October and we support those that have been modeled so far with residential wood burning and char boiling, but again, want to underscore the importance, importance of modeling the ammonia, uh, of modeling ag burning, a ban on ag burning or limiting ag burning against the most current data and not 2013, since we have seen a, a really big increase in open ag burning uh, the, the last year. Uh, so those are just some of the areas, but uh, we have made many recommendations and, and we think it's really important to have that data to move forward to identify what are the the um, measures that that we can we can include in a plan, and I look forward to working with ARB and the district and, and all of you in this process. And again, really appreciate um, your intervention, and especially in the the you know face of you know the new administration and our unfortunate you know local efforts to change the Clean Air Act. Um, you know, having a strong SIP really demonstrates our commitment to the Clean Air Act. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I think it's morning. Uh, Manuel Cunha with the Nisei Farmers League. Madam Chair, of course, and board members and staff. Um, first thing is I want to uh, again introduce myself, Manuel Cunha. I'm president of Nisei Farmers League. Also was one of the very first groups that put together the ag research team under Jan Sharpless back in 1990 and 89. We developed with the staff, the study agency, the CRAPAX, Seaco study, and we went through that process because what we saw in some of the research was that the Sierra Nevadas by Midwest Research Institute showed that we cultivated the Sierra Nevadas twice a year and that we cultivated alfalfa fields 12 times a year. So we knew the data was absolutely, so that's what we put together the group, the study agencies. Spent a lot of money, it was a team effort. EPA, ARB, Agriculture, San Joaquin Valley, and many other air districts. First thing is I want to say is that the numbers that we have for farm equipment was a program that Lynn Terry and many of the staff, even Catherine Witherspoon and others, and Dr. Lloyd, and several of you board members said that if agriculture in the 2008 SIP was able to do stuff from five to 10 tons in a voluntary program for equipment because we didn't have any concepts of how much we had out there, that if we got that, that would be incredible, five to 10 by 2017. Today, just uh, touching the research, it's 12.9 tons, not, they forgot about, I think, NRCS's numbers, but that's okay. I think they're, um, that was the number that was submitted to ARB 
in May of last year and in December of, of 2016, and, and your staff agreed. Your staff agreed to that number because of uh, cleaning it up and whatever else. But what I want to say is that we've done a great job. Now, let me give some funding issues here. First thing is that the ag industry is putting together a meeting with USDA, NRCS, Kearney Research Center, Fresno State, um, and many other ag groups on dealing with a burn conference sometime in late June or July. There will be a conference on ag burn and other burn, including the Sierra Nevadas, because we have a lot of trees up there that have issues across this range. Secondly is that agriculture is meeting with USDA on the farm bill. On the farm bill for NRCS, we've asked for a special project. We averaged 21 million from NRCS, Carl Moyer, somewhere 15 to 20 million um, EPA funds through the DARE program, 118 monies, you name it. And the industry, agriculture, have put over $500 million combination since 2004, which was starting of the ag engines, okay? So in closing, I would just say that we are working with USDA right now, as we speak today, to add another 10 million special grant project to the air quality project for the San Joaquin Valley, on top of what we have. So again, I want to thank the staff. I want to thank Mary Nichols from way back helping to put together the USDA Air Quality Board in the United States. And she was one of, I think, the first person of the representative and turned it over okay, to another Manuel, staff. Thank I'm glad you. to go. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Roger Isom. I'm President and CEO of the California Cotton Generators and Growers Association and the Western Agricultural Processors Association. A couple of things that I want to leave you with today that I, I don't believe have been represented correctly or maybe that you just haven't been made aware of, and that is there's this discussion of the carrot and stick. The fact of the matter is, is that ag has been at the table since the very beginning and actually has not only done their part but done more. Let's talk about ag pump engines. We actually were the first ones, along with ARB and, and the PUC, to create Ag Ice, which was a special program to go above and beyond the Air District rules and get farmers to convert to electric motors. In that first Ag Ice program, we, we turned over 2,000 diesel engines to electric motors, again, above and beyond. And today, we have, with PG&E and their current general rate case, working on Ag Ice 2.0. We're trying to go after those additional engines we didn't get in the first go around. Uh, again, above and beyond the Air District's rules. The tractors have been talked about. We have been to D.C., whether it's the Farm Bill or DERA or to the state level, we have got the additional monies to replace those tractors. And right now, we've been at the Capitol last week looking at ex extending the bill that we carried along with uh, a Summit Rambula to get additional dollars per vehicle in the San Joaquin Valley specifically for clean air. We're actually helping lobby to make sure that funding goes beyond the sunset date of 2023 out to 2032 because it's been such a successful program. Um, on CMPs, the conservation management practices to reduce fugitive dust. When we originally set out on that plan, it was 30, we needed 32 tons a day of PM10 reductions. We sat down, worked with farmers, with ARB, with EPA, the district, with NRCS, brought experts in, and when it was all said and done, we got, not only got compliance with the rule, we got buy-in. We got buy-in from the farming community, and we were actually able to get 34 tons per day of reductions. But we didn't stop there, because we could have. We met the rule, we're done. We didn't. We continued research with EPA, NRCS, worked with a piece of equipment called an ACK Optimizer, which combined operations to get additional reductions, and we've continued to add additional CMPs to our plan. Again, without a mandate to do so. Um, finally, uh, the discussion was made up about ag burning. And, and they're right, with the shutdown of the biomass plants, we're in a crisis situation right now in the San Joaquin Valley. We have a research project right now with West Biofuels, a plant in Woodland that would create biogas, uh, create electricity using that biogas, and we are in our second year of that doing all kinds of different ag uh, waste from prunings to almond shell to uh, cotton stalks, you name it. We've been running it through that. 
in not only seeing that the technology works, but we've also been measuring the emissions to make sure we meet any air quality mandate anywhere in California. And that project's underway right now and, and so far has been a success. So we are continuing to look in all of these areas. We have a good program and we think we can meet any kind of mandate that's out there and go above and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, uh, Vice Chair Berg, members of the board. My name is Ryan Kenny. I'm with Clean Energy. We're the nation's largest provider of renewable natural gas transportation fuel. We're headquartered here in California and have 165 stations alone in the state. Uh, we're talking about the um, horrible environmental and health problems that are happening within the San Joaquin Valley today. And I wanted to just uh, kind of focus our um, remedy on the point of two NOx, uh, low NOx engine with uh, renewable fuel. We're talking about PM, we're also talking about uh, NOx, greenhouse gas emissions, we're talking about federal attainment, and we believe that this is a remedy for much of what's happening in, in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, your mo the ARB's mobile source strategy document does call for 900,000 low NOx vehicles by the year 2031 to reach attainment. And we do believe that there is a significant gap between the goal and the reality of what's being funded right now. Uh, early next year, the 12 liter Cummins Westport uh, point and two NOx engine is due out, and uh, we believe adequate funding, incentive funding, needs to be uh, co uh, contributed towards that. It's not just about the total amount of funding, not just about the funding source, but also about the program provisions that will come before you, which includes uh, covering the appropriate incremental cost of such an engine, and also making sure that the incremental cost is compared to diesel, um, from diesel to the point of two NOx engine, not from natural gas, say to natural gas. Also, it's worth noting that the technology is deployable now. Uh, you have other technologies such as hybrid, uh, fuel cells, battery electric, and according to ARB's technology assessment uh, recently, those technologies in the heavy, heavy duty space, classes seven and eight, uh, with a weight of 26,001 pounds and above, are not due for deployment until 2030, if not later, up to, t up to 2050. And there's a lot, of rain, a lot of issues because of that, but that's, of course, because of ARB's technology assessment finding that. Uh, it's also worth noting that the cost effectiveness is um, worth considering. The uh, zero emission technologies can be up to five times more expensive than uh, a point of two NOx performance standard engine. So you're getting more bang for your buck by going um, with deployable uh, technology today. Just want to wrap up by saying that we do believe in a technology and a fuel neutral approach, but uh, something needs to be done today, and this, this technology with a point of two NOx engine with renewable fuel is, in our view, the way to go. Thank you. Good morning, um, uh, Vice Chair Berg and members, Bonnie Holmes, Jen with the American Lung Association in California. I wanted to thank you, the board, and the staff on behalf of the American Lung Association for your hard work on digging into this challenge and developing this PM strategy for the San Joaquin Valley. Um, we understand it's tough and there's many factors working against us, but it is doable and you have proven that and uh, we are thrilled. So thank you for doing that. It's critical that we take this goal very seriously. According to our annual report, some valley communities are experiencing 40 to 50 unhealthy days of uh, particle pollution every year in the valley, um, over 90 unhealthy days for ozone pollution, and this is clearly unacceptable. Our valley offices work with families in the valley that have multiple kids with asthma that are struggling with the health burdens and costs on a daily basis, and I know many, those of you who live in the valley are very familiar with this, especially our doctors. Um, we have, and we have over 300,000 kids with asthma in the valley, and these patient voices are, are very powerful. Um, we believe you have the right list of tools in the toolbox now, and we need strong coordination between your board and the local district and the local cities and counties, local jurisdictions in the valley to make this happen. Um, we strongly support a focus on zero emission across the transportation sector to get to clean air in the valley. We have a lot more work to, we have a lot of electric options uh, across all classes of vehicles. And I wanted to say specifically, there's a lot of new options becoming available in the, in the heavy duty sector for electric. 
Um, companies are investing in new electric heavy duty technologies. For example, there's a groundbreaking, groundbreaking next week for new electric bus manufacturing facility in Porterville. Um, so great options are available and we need to get to electric to, to fully, uh, to get to sustainable long-term uh, healthy transportation in the valley. Um, the controls on wood burning are incredibly important. We're supporting SB 563 LARA to establish the Wood Smoke Reduction Fund and we'll be pushing for additional funding in the next year uh, to, to fill out that effort. Uh, there are great options for electric and, and cleaner uh, home heating. Uh, just as we have electric options in transportation, we have a great uh, mix of new home heating options that we need to pursue. And get beyond wood, get beyond wood burning. Um, and just another note on working with local governments, we hope that you will reach out and work closely with local governments to the extent possible to um, get them to show leadership in their uh, local government fleets on on zero emission technologies. There's a lot we can do there. Um, lots lots else to say, but since I'm getting to the end, to say thank you for your hard work on behalf of the breathers in San Joaquin Valley and across the state. Thank you for defending the Federal Clean Air Act and moving forward with our very important authority to clean up the air. On behalf of our, our, our organization, our doctors and medical professionals, we urge you to mo move forward and make this plan a reality as quickly as possible. Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Berg and members of uh, the board. Uh, my name is Shreyas Jetker with Coalition for Clean Air. And I'd like to just start off by saying as somebody who's uh, fairly new to California, I've only been here for a few years, uh, the idea that California is this, uh, you know, fully green, um, uh, just, you know, environmentally uh, uh, sound um, place, that, that notion uh, is somewhat shattered when you start to understand the dynamics in the San Joaquin Valley and the land of extremes of California when it comes to uh, environmental contamination uh, and air quality and public health. And of course, the extreme situation in the valley, we've heard um, quite a bit about that uh, with, you know, the highest PM 2.5 levels in the nation. Um, and that exposure is, of course, linked to uh, many different um, chronic diseases, respiratory, uh, as well as heart disease, uh, premature death. Uh, and so because of that, we uh, want to say thanks, as others have, for sending the PM 2.5 plan back to the valley in October of last year um, so that they can search for additional measures to control um, emissions and, and achieve greater emission reductions. Uh, I'll focus, um, as some others have, on mobile source emissions, uh, since I'm here before the ARB and this is uh, uh, your purview. Um, so we know that um, uh, mobile source emissions are, are kind of the leading cause of NOx emissions in the valley. And so it's important to address both on-road and off-road uh, sources of um, uh, those NOx emissions. And as, as others have said, we agree with uh, the, the strategy of a mix of incentives and regulations. Uh, those uh, carrots become much more appetizing when there are sticks in place, uh, as folks know. Um, and uh, not only rules and, and incentives, but of course enforcement, uh, which I feel like um, uh, sometimes we don't talk enough about. So um, in terms of enforcement, uh, we do support in improving uh, enforcement of existing diesel rules uh, and, and new ideas such as the heavy duty smog check program. And because heavy duty diesel trucks alone account for uh, nearly 40% of the NOx emissions, uh, we think it's also important to um, address uh, the point of uh, low NOx engines um, and make sure that there are incentives available uh, for the deployment of those low NOx engines, uh, while of course making sure that incentive funding overall is going to the cleanest technologies available across mobile source categories. Uh, and so, um, uh, we do think that uh, it, it's wise to also make sure that when we promote and support uh, these low NOx engines, uh, there should be a requirement for low carbon renewable fuels. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that when the state is promoting and supporting these uh, low carbon renewable fuels, it's, it's important to have safeguards in place to make sure that that transition doesn't lead to additional pollution in the valley. Uh, and so I'll just close by saying thank you again to the ARB. Uh, your, your role is, of course, critical um, and, uh, and making sure that uh, we reach attainment of PM 2.5 in the valley. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Yolanda Park. A little short. Mm. 
Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. My name is Yolanda Park, and I am the program manager for the Environmental Justice Program at Catholic Charities in the Diocese of Stockton. I encourage the board to seriously consider and to adopt language and policies that will promote the health of all of us living in the valley. Pope Francis says in his encyclical, Laudato Si, this conversation calls for a number of attitudes which together foster a spirit of generous care, full of tenderness. If we do not have a generous, compassionate spirit, we will treat the issues of the valley with indifference or contempt, and as a problem not worthy of full consideration, causing any solutions to be less effective. But I am encouraged by your efforts, and I hope that you will continue pushing strongly onward. The Pope says, halfway measures simply delay the inevitable disaster. Our communities don't have time to wait, and our children don't have time to wait. Therefore, do I urge you and support you to take to heart the, rea the reality of the issue, to uphold stringent measures to clean up our air, and to continue working hard on our behalf. On a more personal note, both my husband and I have seen our allergies and asthma get worse since moving back into the valley. We have three children, very rambunctious children, mm -hmm. <laughs> ages six months, two years, and almost four years. Young family. <laughs> My eldest was diagnosed with allergies within one year of moving back into the valley before age two, having had no previous signs or problems. My middle was diagnosed with asthma after he turned one, and my youngest so showed signs of asthma at the age of three months and had an asthma attack at five months. It extremely hurts to see your children trying to do the one basic action they shouldn't have to struggle to do. To see and literally hear them trying to breathe. It's a terrible feeling of powerlessness. But you have the power to do something about it. Not just for my family, but for all families and all those living in this valley. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the ARB, uh, John Bozell with CalStart. We're a uh, national nonprofit organization dedicated to the development of the clean transportation technologies industry, uh, showing that we can have jobs, economic prosperity, clean air, and protect the climate. Uh, I want to say that uh, I'm very impressed with the progress that has been made to date in the San Joaquin Valley in improving the air quality. Uh, we have done it through a combination of regulation and investments, and I do believe that's what's needed going forward. I do, we do see significant synergy between both our uh, climate reduction, greenhouse gas reduction programs, and our efforts to improve air quality. Those two are not in contrast or in conflict, but, but actually are in synergy. I'd like to run through a few examples of that. We, about a year and a half ago, with funding from the California Energy Commission, we created the San Joaquin Valley Clean Transportation Center. We now have an office in Fresno and are very excited about the potential to do work and what we've already achieved to date. We secured about $12 million in zero emission truck and bus funding from the ARB, from cap and trade funding. So that's actually, those are projects that are going into the valley. We're deploying zero emission buses and trucks to date. So we're learning where are those segments that where zero emission technology makes sense today. So that's uh, very encouraging. We're also very encouraged by the rapid growth of the light duty EV market uh, in, in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, that it's really taking off at a very dramatic rate. Uh, we do need to see long-term incentives put in place, and I'd like to maybe perhaps follow up with the two ARB members to the left, my left here, and talk about how we get the legislature to really understand that we need long-term incentives for, the, for EV purchases, particularly in the Valley, as we need to increase the, uh, the incentives there. I also do want to just quickly thank uh, Dr. Sheriffs for coming to our event yesterday. Fresno County is taking leadership in the deployment of solar powered EV chargers. Fresno County is the first county in the nation to deploy a network of, of solar powered EV chargers. There are 13 small towns, Mendota, Fireball, others that now have solar powered EV chargers as a result of public investment, mostly local investment, Caltrans, the Energy Commission also helped out. 
Uh, I want to say that the clean, the trucking industry is highly fragmented and segmented. Uh, there are places where we should be pushing forward and exploring zero emission technology. I think the ARB is pursuing that on a statewide basis and should be, and we look forward to identifying those niches where zero emission technology can make sense, can be commercially viable. At the same time, there will be a need for internal combustion engine technology. We're very encouraged by the development of the near zero emission uh, engines and the opportunity to develop renewable natural gas in the valley and to keep those transportation dollars local to keep the investment from the fuel coming from the valley and keeping those dollars local and I'm out of time. Let me just say that we, we very much look forward to working with the ARB and others to develop the investments, the future funding that's necessary to hit the 2024 target. Very encouraged by what Roger Isom said earlier about possibly now pursuing the extension of both the AB8, AB118 program and the Carl Moyer program uh, for another decade. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other witnesses who were missed? Okay. Uh, well, this is an informational item, so there's no need to uh, close a record, and we're not taking any formal action today. But um, if any board members have any additional thoughts or uh, questions or concerns, I would like to uh, call on them now, starting with uh, Ms. Mitchell. Yes, Judy. Judy, I'm sorry. I wasn't speaking loudly enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one thing we've heard uh, pretty dramatically from all the people in the audience is uh, the need for incentives to convert the mobile fleet to a cleaner fleet. And um, I couldn't agree more. This is important really for San Joaquin Valley as well as the South Coast. We've referenced carrot and stick but the carrot really should be called very delicious Hershey's chocolate bar because <laughs> that's where we, we need to go on this. Um, I also want to congratulate our staff and, and the interested parties from San Joaquin Valley for working together on this, on this plan pursuant to the board direction given, given last October because it looks like you've accomplished a lot and there's still some more work to do, I understand, with the modeling of... Uh, of, of, of certain things, the ag burning and the, um, and the um, ammonium nitrate. So I assume you'll keep working on that. And, um, and I, I, I'm wondering a little bit about next steps because if we're gonna concentrate on charbroiling and, um, and, uh, and the wood burning, uh, how, how do we do that? We need to work closely with the Air District to is the plan is to strengthen their rules, their regulatory structure, or what would be done? Both for the um, residential wood burning and commercial cooking, those would be sectors that fall under the local air district authority to control. Um, we have done uh, through our modeling and essentially a first initial uh, bogey for how stringent the, the programs need to be going forward. We need to work with the Air District to further refine that modeling. For example, you heard us um, talk about targeting the retrofit of the commercial cooking um, program to the urbanized area in Fresno and Bakersfield, where we see a very, very high uh, level of cooking um, carbon on the filters that we measure. So we can ref do some refinement of, of that modeling as we think about what it's going to take to reach, come all the way to attainment. Um, but it's also going to be important, um, given the time frame it will take to phase in these controls, that the rulemaking begin immediately. And we've suggested to the Air District that we now know enough on these sectors that the workshop process um, can begin in the next month or two so that we can see um, sort of those come forward as full-blown packages um, over the next six to 12 months. Good. I think that's important that um, we keep working with the Air District to start that rulemaking process. And those are in, like near-term reductions that we can see pretty quickly. I, so I think that that's, your, your attack strategy is very good and, and think that we'll see some good results from that. So thank you for the work on this. Uh, Dr. Boss? Yeah. Actually, um, 
I think Dr. Sheriffs, who actually rem represents the San Joaquin Valley, should go. No, go first, please. <laughs> All right. I yield to your colleague on the left. <laughs> All right. So wisdom will follow my comment. <laughs> It's, it's way too early to celebrate, but I am incredibly optimistic and so thrilled by the way this process has rolled out. Uh, I would not have predicted this in October. Uh, and as many others have said, yes, thanks to everybody, everybody who is in this room today who was there in October, and especially, 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 thanks to the public which showed up in Fresno and made us ARB and us, the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, not kick the can down the road um, and make the hard decisions later. Uh, they don't get any easier later. And we clearly have identified some things we can do sooner. And this is all about health. And the sooner we do these things, the more benefit, the more people benefit the sooner, benefit today. You know, we are talking um, hundreds, a thousand premature deaths a year. Um, these are real numbers, uh, real people, uh, real health care costs in terms of children, asthma, ER visits, school days myths, particularly in adults, premature death. Uh, so this is, this is great. Uh, that we have been willing to embark on this and uh, everybody in the community in Fresno, everybody throughout the state, um, boy, the power of the public process and the power of the public to ask questions. That's all that was done. Questions were asked. And what a great process that this board, the San Joaquin board, stepped up um, to work on those answers. Uh, Some, some thoughts, the, the, we're, we are so close, because I don't, I don't think anybody in the room was, was confident we could get anywhere near this close. Uh, there is an important increment left, but we are so close, we absolutely can do this. Um, things have been discussed and put out. We need more information, we need better science, we need better inventories to figure out how we're going to do that. But clearly, in fact, we can do it. This is doable. Um, you know, we found the will to get this far. Amazing. Um, I would like to just a, a couple of specifics. Uh, yeah, the funding issues. Uh, I think we need, as the ARB board, one of the things we need to do is, boy, every, every time there's any money from the VW settlement, we need to look how we can direct more of that to the San Joaquin Valley to assist with that. Um, Roger, thank you very much for your voice. I wish everybody spoke as clearly and loudly and articulately as you do. Thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm glad everybody likes carrots, vegetables. It's not just what we eat. <laughs> it also turns out to be so significant how our food is prepared. Oh my gosh, who would have suspected that there was so much to gain by looking at uh, hamburgers? Um, but again, the focus on health, um, boy, charbroiling, residential burning, open burning, the carbon, uh, these are the most direct and immediate health impacts. And we've identified ways to move it forward. Uh, so, so important. Uh, yes, makes this a public health agency that it is. It's great. Um, you know, I really would echo everything Shiraz said from the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District standpoint. Um, and I think need to highlight a little bit. Uh, yes, we do need to think about some regulations. And I don't think anybody in the room really likes regulations. But we are a regulatory body. The San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District is a regulatory body. And regulatory, regulations um, help us get the job done. Uh, Shiraz mentioned, you know, three things about regulations. One, it's a way to get credit for what we do, because we don't always get that credit when we do it through incentives. 
Um, but it also helps motivate us. Absolutely, those deadlines are so important. And this whole process validates the Clean Air Act and what a brilliant structure that was, is. Um, and the whole issue of fairness. Uh, my farming partner and I chose to chip, not burn. Uh, we paid a financial increment, um, and we're willing to do that. Uh, not everybody will, and that's, that's fine. Uh, but I do think there's an element of fairness for other people in terms of a business and what, what the expectation is and how that's done. Now, I would also, as a physician, when I write a prescription, I am looking for the lowest effective dose. Less, less can help us get there more than more can. Uh, we, we know that. We've learned that. Um, so that is always in the back of our minds as we think about regulations. But I think we do need to, 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 to think about some and how they're going to fit in and helping us get where we need to go. Um, I, I do have to say one thing, just because every time I come to a meeting in Sacramento, I am so excited by the possibilities and I want to go back to the comments. Yeah, yesterday in Fowler, you know, these things are possible and we're moving forward. We need to keep moving forward. So yesterday in Fowler, we have a ribbon cutting uh, for these freestanding solar charging stations. What a concept. Phenomenal. And thanks to CalSTART, thanks to the Energy Commission, thanks to the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, putting time and money into these things to get this going. What an incredible demonstration. So next week, there's going to be a ribbon cutting in Porterville. And ARB can take a lot of credit for making this happen, because Porterville, the community, has made a commitment to fully electrify their transit system. Fantastic. Next week in Fresno, hopefully we can find a room at the Air District. We're going to have a demonstration of an all-electric farm tractor. Wow, yes. Uh, you know, the technology is there. It is moving forward. And one of the comments I made yesterday at the ribbon cutting is I pointed to my all-electric car. And the all-electric car that came from Los Angeles on one charge, and it was not a Tesla. <laughs> okay? So this is out there. It's growing. It's getting less expensive. And I said, take a picture because those are Model Ts. And in 20 years, we're going to be astonished that people were driving those things, how primitive they were. <laughs> so forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Baums. And then Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, thank Chair, Chair Nichols. Nichols. Uh, well, Baums first. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll take the uh, ball passed by. Uh, my fellow physician about effective dose, lowest effective dose, I also want to apply that to public health. So the lowest dose of air pollution means the <laughs> limited uh, limitation of the adverse health effects. And uh, I also want to thank uh, those who testified ab about the spirit of cooperation that I heard for the most part uh, and, and a support for that creative tension between environmental advocacy groups and the district, and between the district and uh, our board. Uh, I think this is an example of democracy in action. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm proud to be on this board, because we actually pay attention to the public, uh, and the public from all sectors, whether it's the regulated entities or the, the public. Um, so I've been working in Fresno in terms of uh, air pollution health effects since around 2000. Um, so I, I have some feel for uh, what sources contribute to the pollution and the, the health impacts. And I don't think I need to remind everyone that the, the population that's impacted by uh, bad air quality in the San Joaquin Valley is a particularly vulnerable population. Uh, you know, I, w I was appreciative of, sh of uh, the Air Pollution Control District mentioning um, the, the fact that there are so many uh, disadvantaged areas, communities in the Central Valley or in the San Joaquin Valley. I've learned to separate the two. San Joaquin Valley, uh, according to Cal Enviroscreen, remember that. Uh, sometimes uh, leadership of your agency forgets about that. Uh, 
if your executive director had shown up, I would have given him a piece of my mind, but I won't give you that uh, piece. Um, and I don't want to talk about the low-hanging fruit uh, that's been mentioned in terms of uh, residential wood burning, which is a big contributor to the PM, especially in the winter months uh, in the SJV and uh, the charcoal uh, grilling restaurants. We have other areas that we haven't spent that much time on uh, today, but I appreciate staff's, uh, it's on page 12, uh, additional stakeholder suggestions. I just wanna, I think we need to pay attention, uh, especially for the future, given that we're not going to uh, achieve attainment, even with all that's on the table, uh, all that, we, that the district agrees on with us. Uh, so, ag trucks are an issue. There are, you know, uh, I think if I remember correctly, those that uh, are devoted to ag uh, transport that have less than 25,000 miles a year uh, can be dirty diesel. And if we're talking about biomass burning, what kind of trucks are taking that biomass to the biomass incinerators and, and power generators? It's those dirty trucks, I would imagine. I don't know that for a fact. Um, oil drilling equipment. I know that mostly it's powered, or more and more of it's powered by natural gas uh, as opposed to diesel, but uh, you know, whatever diesel equipment's still out there needs to be uh, considered, but uh, even the natural gas, if it's the cleanest available technology, is still dirty, relatively speaking. It, it contributes to PM, and I think, again, I don't know the numbers, but I think that there's a fair amount in Kern County that's of PM and NOx that are generated by oil and gas extraction equipment. Um, not to mention the steam, um, I guess that's what's probably powered by natural gas is the boilers for the steam that's used to frack uh, our oil, which we've been doing for a long time, uh, way before other states uh, have been fracking for natural gas. Uh, I've studied agricultural burning, uh, rice straw, Bernie, I was funded by this agency before I was on the board, well, many years before I was on the board, to study the uh, health effects of you know, rice straw burning. Um, we need to get away from agriculture burning. It's a, it's, you know, that's what they do in Indonesia and Brazil. Uh, you know, we should be able to find a cleaner way of, of dealing with ag waste. Um, and then, you know, I, I want to echo something that Dolores Weller said about contingency plans. You know, we're not going to make it even with what we've got in place. So if some of our projections don't work out, we knew, do need to have contingency plans. So I would encourage both the district and uh, our staff to consider contingency plans. And last but not least, uh, I've also studied ammonium nitrate funded by this uh, agency. And while ammonium nitrate it doesn't have the same toxicity as diesel exhaust particles, I, I think our current feeling that you know, really no PM is safe PM uh, in terms of health. So I think given how much ammonium nitrate is uh, contributing to the overall PM uh, load in the SJV uh, airshed, um, I think modeling how that ammonia, uh, the trends in that ammonia emissions and, and the generation of ammonium nitrate uh, and possible ways to control that are, are something we should do. I don't think we're ready to put controls on ammonia uh, at this point, but I think we are at a point where we should be modeling effective strategies in that regard. So uh, uh, last but not least, I, I did want to thank uh, Mr. Issam uh, for his uh, enthusiastic uh, embrace of efforts to uh, have the farm community do their part in terms of improving air quality in the San Joaquin Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Serna. Thank you. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking the numerous speakers that uh, were here to uh, provide their personal testimonies um, about themselves and their families in terms of the health consequence of PM 2.5 in the Central Valley. Um, we hear a number of 
speakers on a lot of subjects, uh, but I can tell you both in my capacity as a local elected person and a member of this board that when we hear um, the um, effect that it's having on your health, uh, I think that's, at least for me, that's what uh, tends to, to move my thinking um, the most at times. So I want to start by thanking those that were willing to uh, share from that perspective. Um, I also want to say that I was incredibly <laughs> impressed with uh, uh, Ms. Luna, Destiny Luna, uh, who um, I, I lean over to my uh, colleague here and mentioned that, uh, boy, she does a better job at speaking and making her point than a lot of adults do. <laughs> uh, well, she is an adult. She's a young adult. But, uh, but I, I, again, very impressed with uh, not just Destiny, but all the young people, the, the students that uh, were here to pr uh, provide uh, testimony. Those were your federal research dollars at work, by the way. Good. At least, at least there's something good coming out of uh, federal government there. Um, Shh, don't tell anybody. Right. Otherwise, they'll cut it off too. Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to um, mention something that I brought up during my briefing, and I guess I'm looking squarely at our chief economist on this. Um, it's just a it's a underscore. Um, uh, uh, I want to underscore why I think it's important uh, because we have a charge at this board to not just apply the science and rule make with just an eye on public health and just an eye on uh, greenhouse gas reduction and just a, an eye on uh, reducing criteria of pollutants, but we have a charge to do that, tempering it with what are uh, not just the health consequences, but the economic consequences and the environmental justice consequences. There are a lot of moving parts to what we do. Uh, but when it comes to electrifying uh, school buses, which is something that uh, a number of stakeholders and advocates have um, been, I think, rightfully pressing for in an effort to continue to reduce uh, uh, black carbon and, and PM 2.5, whether it be in the Central Valley or other parts of the state of California, um, what I'm here, beginning to hear more and more uh, from, from school district representatives is that that is having a, uh, while the interest continues to grow in electrifying school bus fleets, it, it continues to be a growing uh, concern. I can understand why, again, being uh, holding lo local elected office, uh, that that's going to have a very significant uh, fiscal consequence for those districts. And um, I think they're fearful that the closer we get to actually implementing that and whether there be um, strict regulations or strict regulations more so with without any incentives, uh, they're fearful that that will uh, mean that there'll have to be cuts elsewhere in those those local school district budgets. So I just want to um, make public mention of that because I think it's a very imp uh, important uh, concept to keep in mind the closer we get to, um, I think, doing what everyone wants to do, including the school districts themselves, but there is a consequence to that. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Techborian. Thank you. Um, just wanted to add my appreciation to the public uh, from the San Joaquin Valley for your incredible uh, expertise that you've applied to this issue, uh, and especially for your persistence and your pressure Really, uh, I don't know how that we would be here without without what you've done. And um, I am really moved by the work that you've done and the the distance that you've allowed us to go, um, and the the place that we've landed today. And I really want to commend the ARB staff. Um, I've heard this in multiple places for the last few months um, that your work with the community has really been stellar that you've uh, been accessible and been responsive and uh, and truly listened. So I've been to lots of public hearings, and um, there's lots of no listening going on. Um, we're checking the boxes, but I don't think that's what happened in this situation. And um, I'm really appreciative for that. And I appreciate the collaboration and the cooperation and the congratulations and gratitude that is being expressed today. I think that's really generous. Um, cause I'm pretty saddened by the loss that we've had, the loss of life, um, the shortened lives and the lives that have been diminished. And we've heard about those. And my colleague, I think just talked about that as well. And I, 
I don't want us to forget that. So we need to do as much as we can, as quickly as we can in the San Joaquin Valley, and we need to use this as a lesson for every other district and for the state of California to say we can't turn our backs on people who are suffering because those days are lost, those lives are lost, we're not getting those back. And I don't want to be overly dramatic about this and be, you know, be a bummer about it, but um, that's just true. So we just need to face that and um, move forward in a positive and collaborative way, but I just don't want us to gloss over what has, has been lost. So, um, so we need to redouble our efforts. I, I want to make sure that the recommendations that have come forward in terms of the ammonia modeling to assess the further reductions, the inventory of the ag equipment, the, the assessment of the contingency measures on ag burning, um, uh, on banning burning, um, and particularly on, I think a principle is no incentives without regulations. I mean, if we have a really good model with that, with a variety of other programs, that the regulations come into place, early compliance gets um, incentives, and I, I think that's the model we need to use. So I, I hope we can utilize that principle, and I'd be, really love to hear from staff about that. And I, I do want to offer my congratulations on um, Mr. Carpatos, your, um, your defense of the Clean Air Act, and I really appreciate that. And I, um, I have to say that I'm offended um, by anybody that's representing air quality in the state of California that isn't um, defending the Clean Air Act and defending the work that we've done in the state of California. So um, I, and again, I appreciate the work of CARB staff and the work of the public and, you know, we got to hold our heads up and move forward. But um, that, uh, I think we have to call that out and make sure that that's not uh, happening within the jurisdiction and the authority that we have. So I'd love to hear more about your plans on particularly the um, ammonia modeling and the inventory. Uh, do I see any additional hands in the air? Uh, this way, you know, I was going to call out Senator Flores before he yeah. raised his hand, so I just I, have to I, introduce. I did not want to repeat what everyone was going to say, so <laughs> I, 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 I want to say though I that won't. you, you did something it. about yeah. the ag burning issue a long time ago, which I well remember. So that, by way of introduction, you thank have you. some you have some credentials here. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I appreciate it, and er everyone's comments. I'll try not to repeat it. Uh, but I would like to say a couple of things uh, to the advocates who came down from the Central Valley. It is a trek. It has always been a trek. Uh, you wonder if Sacramento listens, and I think you're seeing progress, uh, slow it, as it may be. Uh, it is progress. I want to thank the board for putting a pause on this in Fresno. And you see what happens when you put a pause on things sometimes, good conversations, leverage, a staff that is dedicated here to uh, really push the district in ways that I think the district would like to have skated past this uh, in Fresno. So I think uh, really, if anything else, I want to thank uh, our staff for being diligent and pushing. But so now as board member, let me push staff a little further, uh, mm -hmm. if I could. So I, you know, I definitely think we need more data, better data, transparent data. Uh, the issue of ag inventory has to be on the table, should be on the table, should be part of what we do here, and should be part of our evaluation process. Um, I also think the transparency that does not exist between our district and the San Joaquin Valley's district needs to be amended. We need to fix that. We need to figure out a better way to have more transparent data we agree on, early data, not late data, and that we're all on the same page. I heard uh, a couple of folks on both sides, and I say both sides because there are yeses and nos on our comment sheets, so I'm kind of wondering what we're saying no to. But it seemed to me that uh, we should have a more transparent process. I know that's difficult. I've dealt with that district for many, many years. I understand uh, the obstacles, but I do think we need to push there. Data will get us past a lot of the conversations of us passing, uh, talking past each other. So let me just make that point. The second is innovation. Uh, clearly, we need to innovate our way out of this very dire situation in the Central Valley. There are lots of things to innovate. Uh, Tom Franz didn't mention things like uh, solar ag pumps. He mentioned tractors, but there are a lot of other things that we should be looking at as part of the inventory. Solar has to be a very big part. I do know that a lot of our water districts are iterating towards that. 
I know a lot of our farmers are moving in that direction, but I do think uh, the renewable side of this equation has to be there, particularly as you look at your charts that talked about the percentage of carbon. And this is a nice co-benefit here. So we always are looking for co-benefits. And I think if you look at the Central Valley, that renewable side, that carbon side, uh, I would say that what's lacking, which a couple of people mentioned earlier, is the investment in infrastructure on the EV side. So no doubt that Central Valley is short on infrastructure for charging. Uh, it's the reason people keep bringing up Volkswagen. And the reality is no one's going to buy a car in Delano if they have to drive 30 miles to the highway to charge it. So the reality of the Volkswagen settlement for these communities, if we look at this chart, is more infrastructure, closer infrastructure, not drive to infrastructure, but in infrastructure where you can actually plug your car in. So I would say that that kind of innovation, this board can, board can spur. And I think we should continue to push on, particularly on the Volkswagen settlement, the Fiat settlement, and whatever else is coming. So I think you know, as we start to look at these things, infrastructure is going to be very critical for the Central Valley. I applaud our farmers and our uh, water folks for doing as much as they can with scarce resources. Um, I would hope that we would focus on that. The last thing I just want to mention is uh, two other items, accountability. Uh, this board has a challenge to put together a large plan for the federal government. Whether they look at it or not, we will continue to push on that endeavor. But I do want to make sure that everyone recognizes that the people in the Central Valley, this Air Board, is part of that puzzle. It has to work as hard as anyone else. So if Judy is looking at South Coast and she's making it work hard, this district has to carry its weight as well. It is all one plan, one puzzle. And when one piece doesn't do its job, it makes it a lot harder at every other representative here who has a district to make them do their job. So I would say that I would not be shy on pushing this district to do its fair share. We absolutely have to make sure because it makes it harder on every single person who's representing an air district here to do their fair share as well. Um, follow up, I would simply say uh, never an issue with all of you folks as staff. You're very, very responsive. Um, I know your boxes are inundated with emails from all of us board members, but I do want to thank you for pushing on this and particularly uh, for Webster and Karen spending time in the Valley. It's important. I'm very appreciative of the chair going to Fresno. That created a whole new dynamic. And I hope that when we go back again, we'll go to Bakersfield, which I think is ground zero. Uh, for air pollution. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to some of the innovations and some of the things, believe it or not, that China is doing on the air pollution front that we could actually bring back to this Central Valley to really try to make some really lasting change on those few items that are still remaining. And I'm really happy that you mentioned the word dairy. It was too late in the presentation. It was like late in the slides. But <laughs> methane has got to be our new push in the Central Valley. If we're not talking methane, I think we're really missing the boat. And I know that's very hard. But I do think that those are the kinds of things that we have to innovate our way through. And thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the fact that we have taken as much of our day as we have on this item is indicative of the um, recognition that the board uh, has of the scope and the seriousness of the problems that the Valley is facing and dealing with its public health. And also, as uh, Senator Flores just said, uh, its role uh, as a generator of greenhouse gas emissions as well. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's helpful sometimes to me when I think about this enormous state of ours, uh, as diverse as it is um, geographically as well as as well as well uh, uh, economically and uh, ethnically, that um, the Valley is in some sense our underdeveloped area and needs to be looked at from the perspective of how we really can demonstrate to the world if we're serious about uh, continuing our leadership in uh, global environmental and climate issues uh, that we can have uh, significant growth and improvements in op opportunity and prosperity while at the same time tackling uh, serious environmental challenges as well. So um, this is uh, an important step forward, but it is just one step forward and what I know is going to be a, a long process. I too want to thank everyone who came and for all of the hard work that people are putting into this effort. 
And I think with that, we... But Madam uh, Chair, before, sorry, as you me. wrap up, yes. um, could we just hear from staff on the timing oh, going yes, forward? Yes. And mm -hmm. including the time frames that um, um, were asked on the modeling um, time frames that we'll be able to get those done in time for the rule to come back. Actually, that was what I was going to do, but it's okay. <laughs> You've just had to jump in. All right, that's fine. That's okay. That's go ahead, please. Okay. So, right, questions were raised um, about ammonia modeling. Um, as you heard, we have done some preliminary modeling on that, looking at a thirty percent reduction, um, and shared that with the communities. US EPA has guidance on how we approach this, um, and they actually suggest that we look at a range between 30% and 70%. Um, so that's what we will be jumping on next, is to do that 70% range, so we have the bracketing to understand better um, what the range of benefits could be at the same time as we continue to look um, at more of the research to better understand what um, different management practices might mean in terms of reducing not only ammonia, but also methane and VOCs. Um, what I think one of the very strong benefits that we have now is that our modeling has advanced to a point where we can really be very sophisticated and strategic in terms of how we explore potential control strategies. I mean, so that is something that we will be working on over the next couple of months as we look at closing that gap. Um, the Air District has also been developing a modeling capability, and we've been working closely with them. So that also provides of advantage of having sort of an increasingly larger staff that we can collectively bring to bear um, as we look at additional strategies. Um, so as, it, as we said in the presentation, this will take you know a fair amount of work, but there is a lot that we can do to continue to explore these strategies. I, mean, I think we see those going forward over the next few months um, of the summertime, and we will continue to be engaging with the district, coming back into the valley to be sharing all of that additional modeling information that can help inform all of us working together on the strategy. Um, the last, the other question that was asked was about our ag inventory. Um, this is something that we worked very closely with the ag industry um, a little over about 10 years ago to collect really detailed information about agricultural practices, farm size, um, the different tier distributions, and that has been reflected in the inventories that we've been incorporating into the SIPs over the last few years. But probably something that we've been a little deficient upon is having some additional documentation that can be made available to the public and our website that really provides people with an understanding of the granularity of the information we have. So our staff is working on that right now, um, and we will plan to be able to make that information available too. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think that does it then. Um, it's uh, 10 past 12, as everyone can see, and um, we have two items. We were scheduled to have a lunch break, and I think we should uh, go ahead and do that if folks are willing. Okay, great. Then we will adjourn, and uh, we will be back at 1.30 for the final part of the agenda. Thank you. <laughs>